you're a little slow with my lesson of not always getting your way. But, Cherry, he said, there are rapists out there, serial killers. Look at the news for once. Girls get kidnapped constantly, and there are dead joggers in every alleyway. And for the bottom line, I made a request of my apprentice, and I don't ask twice. She wore his gym pants home. Wearing short shorts at school didn't seem a blast anymore, either. And after the dance, in the back seat, Callum put his hand on her knee and she felt weird about it. The hunger gnawed at her stomach, and she made his car lurch forward in the parking lot each time his hand moved up her leg. Wow, she said. Ghost car. Callum dumped her the next day. Mr. Hollis handed her Kleenex when she cried. The spell that year was stop. She knew enough now to dread it. Mr. Hollis sat with her in meditative yoga poses on the floor of her living room as the scent of rot and old washing tickled her nose. She sneezed. She fidgeted. She popped her knuckles one by one until he came to show her how to hold her hands. And then it was easy. It was stupid easy, really. The trick was understanding gravity. Thanks, remedial physics. And that she was working magic to oppose a force, not flow with one as she did rolling ball bearings. Cherry could make marble after marble hang in midair like tiny spaceships. Water shivered to a halt as Mr. Hollis upended a glass over the rug. Her master magician watched her progress over his newspaper or with an eye on a TiVo'd episode of Seinfeld while she tossed up handful after handful of flour to stop dead as fine white mist. The downside was that you got even hungrier than before. That was the year of the accident. Some douchebag in a Ford came screaming out of the intersection as Mr. Hollis made a June morning car ride to the beach. Cherry rode shotgun with the umbrella. Brakes squealed as the guy saw his mistake too late, about to plow right into the driver door. And she stopped his car so hard that her fingernails twisted. Most of the tiny veins in her eyeballs popped. Blood leaked from her mouth and ears and nose as she gave everything, fed everything into the furnace of her magic as a starving body fed on tissue went out of options. The last thing she thought she saw were his hands raised above the steering wheel, and then she blacked out. When she woke up, it was on his couch, to the smell of food. Every breath made her lungs scream. Mr. Hollis knelt next to her with a bowl and a forkful of gamey meat liberally covered in teriyaki sauce, and that meat smelled like fried chicken, like Fudge sundaes and candy floss, like everything that used to make her mouth water. The first bite she choked on in her eagerness. For the love of God, slower, he said, and chew, please. I've long forgotten how to Heimlich cherry. Each morsel of that meal warmed her from the tips of her toes to the crown of her skull. It was almost enough that she didn't look at the expression on his face, the grim, painful tenderness, sweat sweeping back his dark hair. There were little sprays of gray at the temples. He wasn't even forty, and the gray made her terribly sad somehow. But she was less sad than she was starving. What is this? Chew, swallow, rinse, Wash, repeat, he said, but the taut line of his mouth was softening. Cherry opened her mouth like a little baby bird for the next forkful. Her master magician hesitated uncharacteristically. An hour ago, this was real live goat. That is literally disgusting, she said. Goats are adorable. Mr. Hollis loaded up the fork again, and she licked all the tines. The bloodied crust at her nose and eyes didn't matter anymore. She could have run a marathon. Is goat always this good? Because this is awesome. I'll let you in on a little secret as your mentor. 
The texture of the pale teriyaki fry-up was a little weird, a little dry. But he was mashing his fork against the side of the bowl to get her every last delicious bit. When something dies, Cherry, it leaves a little bit of itself behind. That part, and I'll call it life force, starts to dissipate out the body immediately. But if we get it, and we get it fresh, well, we're not hungry after that. So, we should just be fruititarians, she said, wiping her tongue around the corners of her mouth. The hunger had eased, and the pain had driven a couple blocks away. Pick apples off the trees, eat them right there. If it was that easy, I'd be dismembering broccoli plants. What do you do? Terrible things to God's own creatures for you, her master magician said, which struck her as a little evasive. The bull went away. Cherry looked at the fine bones of his face as he cleaned up hers, his dignified jaw, his slash of a nose, his eyes, the unbelievably pale gray of snow three days old, with faint crow's feet. Mr. Hollis was old before his time. Now he was dabbing her forehead, her ears, and he said, You should have trusted me to take care of that car. Don't you ever do that to me again, Charlene Murphy, or so help me I don't know what I'll do. She felt drunk, or at least what drunk probably felt like. Cherry. You're a brat. He was touching her hair. Charlene never did suit. I like how you always called me Cherry. She really was drunk. Like, ma chérie, am I right? Mr. Hollis's expression soothed into something careful and polite, and he took his hand away from her hair. Get some rest, he said, and he laid his jacket over her legs as he stood up and took the bowl. There was neutral kindness in his voice, the type which made her burn with teen humiliation, or would have if she hadn't been high off feeling full and sleepy for the first time since forever. No more magic for a while. Before she dozed off, she thought she heard him eating in the kitchen, cramming something into his mouth and chewing before frantic, wet swallows. When she was fifteen, Mr. Hollis told her, We've come this far, you and I. You can call me John. Cherry slipped up on it all the time and called him Mr. Hollis more than she called him John. She practiced in the mirror with it. John. John. Johnny. Jack. John. John Hollis. John Hollis, the magician. Cherry Murphy, the apprentice. John and Cherry. Charlene and John. She was too old and experienced to be in love with him. Seriously, only stupid kids did that with their teachers. And as he said, she wasn't stupid. He damned with faint praise. Cherry had come a long way. He was a god-king, but she was his lieutenant, his right hand and left, his holy ghost. She read Vonnegut and Faulkner without needing his recommendation. Cherry could also drive between the hours of 12.30 a.m. and 5 p.m., which was cool. This was the year of the cappuccino, and they sat around his kitchen table, sipping them as they swapped sections of the newspaper. It was also the year of the world's most disappointing growth spurt. She'd made five foot one and stopped, resigned to smurfitude until the next spurt hit, doomed to skinny legs and arms and brown hair that had never gone blonde. It was depressing. Even her eyes were heading more beigeward than chocolate. To cheer herself up, Cherry wore hipster scarves and bobby socks, and she gave all her Daisy Dukes to the Salvation Army. When are you going to move in with Jen? She said. This apartment smells like leprosy. I can't believe how much you pay for it. One day I may want to pick up and leave. So you abide in this creepy shack instead? Are you this afraid of commitment? John was a champ with non-responses. Wouldn't you like to know? Yes, I would. No rhetorical. 
Leave my love life alone, Cherry, he said. I won't ask twice. He still set her bedtimes, twelve o'clock on weeknights, two o'clock on Saturday and Friday. Her dad was having a midlife fatherhood AA crisis and kept having family dinners with her, telling her awkwardly she was looking more like mom each day. To get through those meals, Mr. Hollis sometimes even set her menu. Like, eat all your green vegetables, but nothing else. They both knew that table food was a joke. The hunger was an old sickness. Eating the goat ruined her for everything else. Sometimes she and John went down to the sea where she shore fished, gutting his catch in record time, and they sat there gorging themselves on fresh, raw perch squirted with hot sauce. But it was never really the same. When they read together, she found herself leaning in so that their faces were nearly touching. Cherry let her bare shoulder touch the thin polyester of his shirt, imagining the hot blood going through his veins that made his skin warm through the fabric. She sat on the kitchen table and swung her legs from side to side as he worked at his laptop, completely ignored in a way that was nearly acknowledgement. Well, fifteen is a gulf away from fourteen, said John one day, shoulders slumped back in his chair. I think you're old enough to have this. It was Vladimir Nabokov, Lolita. Cherry turned the book over and over, feeling the weight of it in her hands like it was lead. His novel about pedophilia, she said, and regretted how dumb that sounded. That's the obvious reading. The chair tipped back and forth, his gaze on the ceiling in contemplation. The other one is about devouring somebody's life. It took her a while to get up the courage to read it. When she cracked open the cover, she broke his rule to spend three sleepless nights finishing the thing, reading it at lunch times, reading it in study hall in another dust cover, skipping gym and reading it in the park. When she tried to talk about it, he was so removed on the subject that she stopped, angry somehow, like he'd breached the terms of their contract and he shook away her hand when she rested her fingers over his own. For someone so clever, you can be an unbelievably stupid kid, he said abruptly. That shot told. I haven't been a kid in a while, John. You're a child, Charlene. Don't fool yourself. You don't know anything. So she stopped touching him. That was the year she felt very tired. The spell that year was make. If she'd still been riding high on last year's successes, it would have killed her. As it was, she spent her time mechanically breathing life back into dead matches, watching the blackened wood burst into flame that spluttered out as quickly as it flared. Cherry spent long nights trying to coax water to ice and ice to water again with red, raw hands. Make was a double-edged sword. Creating things was easy enough, but sustaining them was like eating soup with a fork. And after the most half-assed attempt, she'd also be so hungry that she'd chew her hair and her nails trying to make the feeling go away. Sometimes she thought about eating styrofoam peanuts just to fill up the space in her gut. Mr. Hollis withdrew from her into an armored shell, emerging only sporadically like he was guilty for the absence. Cherry was good at absences, the best, and it hardly hurt unless you thought about it suddenly. He sat across the kitchen table with a crossword, a great wall of silence spanning between master and apprentice as she tried to make a bud unfurl on his spider plant. Sometimes he'd stand by the window and make tiny incisions in the air with his fingers. And then Jen would suddenly show up and she'd be kicked out and flipping the bird at his closed door. She was pretty surprised when that summer came and she got dragged off to the beach as per usual. She almost thought he'd cancel summer due to lack of goddamned interest. There was no comment on her bikini that long, hot July. She kicked around in the tidal pools trying to make starfish grow back their legs, slathered with sunscreen and visceral disappointment. John spent his time under the umbrella with the newspaper, and she spent her time talking to dusty blonde surfer boys with 
loud patterned board shorts. Seagulls, cawed. He was fiddling with his sunglasses, saying nothing. The crow's feet were tracking deeper indents at his eyes and mouth than they had been when she'd first met him. Back then, she'd never noticed his age, only that he was old. Now he just looked young with premature crow's feet. You need some Botox, she added, and unnecessarily reached out her hand to touch his cheek. John flinched, then pretended he hadn't. God only knows, Cherry, he said, with a little bit of the old humor. Sometimes I feel there's nothing left to teach you. Maybe it's time to move on. That made her a little bit crazy, and with hunger it made her frantic. Matches, spider plants, and ice cubes lost all appeal. June lost its sunshine. She threw herself down on her bed and cradled her head like her thoughts would pop off the top of her skull. Fueled by his retreat and his distance, the specter of that idea haunted her like Casper the friendly ghost on meth. When she turned up on his doorstep at 2 a.m., he didn't look surprised, just tired. You can't send me away anymore, she said. You see, I've got nowhere else to go. His apartment at night was full of unfamiliar shapes, the fan wafting stale air around the room and the carpet sticky beneath her feet. Without saying a word, he led her to his hall closet, putting her hand on the doorknob before sitting down at the kitchen table in his sweatpants and T-shirt. John didn't look at her, just rubbed his hands together like restless birds. I was waiting for you to grow up, he said. After she flicked the light bulb on, the closet was full of jackets and beach umbrellas, stacks of books and an old vacuum cleaner. Half hidden beneath a parka was a freshly dead stranger in jogging shoes whose thighs had been carefully sectioned and long strips of meat taken away. There was blood underfoot. At the familiar smell of old putrefaction overlaying new putrefaction, she gagged until tears came into her eyes. It filled her nostrils. It filled her mouth. Magicians eat, he said, looking at her with eyes the color of ghosts. We eat more and more and more, Cherry Murphy, of anything we can get our hands on. A careless shrug. Just look at me. I ate your childhood. The doorframe scored her back as she dropped to her haunches, hugging her knees tightly to her chest. Every so often she'd involuntarily gag again, rocking back and forth until John came and carried her away. She gagged into his chest and struggled when he put her in his lap, fisting her hands in his T-shirt, wadding it up into her lips so that she wouldn't scream. His hand threaded hard through her hair. Saliva filled up her mouth and overflowed in trickles down his front. She was crying so hard she couldn't say a word. His fingers finally tugged his shirt front away from her teeth as she drew more and more down her gullet. On her shoulders his thumbs dug deep into her collarbones, and now that he was looking at her his eyes were sunken and gleaming like the hearts of white stars. Every line in his face was deep and hard and old. It was never goat, was it? Sweetheart, I couldn't kill a goat, said Mr. Hollis. They're adorable. This close up he smelled of acrid sweat and Listerine and her spittle, and her master magician had his arm around her to tether her down. He'd killed someone. He'd stashed them in his closet. He'd done it before. With an awful, dreadful surety, he slowly pressed her head into the table. Balls in your court, said John. Her stomach growled. I want some teriyaki sauce and a fork, said Cherry. Kill all monsters.
by Gary McMahon. Two or three miles south of Sheffield, they pulled off the M1 motorway and into the badly lit car park of a grubby little humchef roadside restaurant. Squat buildings huddled in the darkness, separated by narrow patches of overgrown wasteland. The road was narrow. The aged asphalt surface was cracked and blistered. The woman glanced at the clock on the dashboard. It was 2.30 a.m. The child was asleep in the back, snoring softly. The woman reached across and clasped the man's hand on the steering wheel. Darkness pressed against the windows and the sides of the car. Metal creaked. The engine cooled. Here, she said softly. Shall we risk it? The man nodded. We need to eat. Something to drink. We can't just keep driving. His gaze was locked dead ahead, focused on a point a few yards from the windscreen. There wasn't much to see, but he was staring intensely. A high, white, rendered concrete wall, a row of gray plastic bins, a pile of black rubbish bags with their tops knotted. I'll wake the child, she said, opening the car door. The interior light came on, flickered. The inrush of cold air from outside was like an unexpected kiss. It lifted her. She felt unfettered from the small, claustrophobic world inside the car. She could barely hear the traffic from the motorway, just the occasional hypnotic swish of hot rubber on smooth tarmac. She walked around to the back of the car and opened the rear door. The child was lying across the back seat, her long, thin legs stretched out on the upholstery. Light from the small, jittery overhead bulb pooled around her face and gathered in her long, blonde hair. Time to get up, she said, reaching inside to give the child's arm a shake. We're here. The child stirred, sat up, blinking. She rubbed at her cheeks, scratched her head. I'm hungry, she said. I know, you're always hungry. The woman smiled and stepped back, moving in a crouch away from the car to let the child climb out. She caught sight of her own face in the wing mirror. There were dark bags around her eyes, but the bruises on her cheek had faded to look like smudges of dirt. Her long sleeves hid scratches on her arms. It's okay, she thought. You're fine now. The car park wasn't busy. Only a handful of vehicles sat in white-lined spaces. It was too late for the dinner traffic and too early for the breakfast crowd. The man got out of the car, waited, and then locked the doors. He walked ahead of them, towards the island of light that was the restaurant, and paused, holding open the double doors until they caught up. Just be cool, said the woman. Be cool. The man nodded, smiling. If he's still able to smile, she thought. Things can't be too bad. They walked inside and sat down at a table in the window. It always had to be in the window. The man claimed that he hated feeling hemmed in and that being able to look outside helped to calm him. Is it waitress service? He picked up a salt cellar and shook it. Tiny grains of salt made a small conical pile on the red plastic tablecloth, an unstable construction that might collapse at any given moment. I don't know said the woman, afraid for some reason that the little hill of salt might crumble and provoke an outburst from the man. I'll go see. She stood quickly and eagerly and walked over to the checkout. A bored young girl, barely out of her teens, was flicking through a magazine and chewing a wad of gum. Excuse me, said the woman. Is it self-service? Yeah, said the young girl, without even looking up. Her dark red fingernails flashed as she quickly turned the pages of the magazine. The woman returned to the table. She didn't sit back down. She knew the man hated the kind of impatient, fuck-you attitude demonstrated by the girl. It was a trigger. It's get your own. The food's over there. She used her thumb to point without looking back towards the checkout. The man nodded. Okay, that's fine. I'll get the stuff. What do you need? 
She was aware that her question could be taken in one of an infinite number of ways. The man glanced up. His lips were pressed tightly together. They were thin and pale. I'll have a sandwich, he said. His lips regained their natural color as he moved them. Tuna or ham? Something like that. You know what I like. And the coffee? Black, no sugar. The woman nodded. What about you? The child was staring out of the window. Can I have a donut? Yes, said the woman. And some milk? Yeah, milk. The woman waited a few seconds to make sure they were done and then walked towards the food displays. She grabbed a tray from the pile, squares of thin brown plastic made to look like wood, and walked along the refrigerated display cases. She took a tuna and sweet corn sandwich on white bread for the man, a fresh cream donut for the girl, and a cheese salad for herself. She poured two cups of coffee into cardboard cups at the machine and took a carton of milk from a chiller box next to the checkout. For a moment, she felt like crying, so she stood there and waited for it to pass. There was a heavy weight in her chest, pressing against her ribs. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Then, once the sensation had passed, she opened her eyes again. She paid the cashier without speaking. It was better that way. She didn't want to communicate with someone so hideously empty. She knew exactly what the man would have done and was thankful that she'd been the one to get the food. She returned to the table with the tray of provisions. The man tore the wrapper off his sandwich and wolfed it down. The child nibbled at her donut, slowly licking the cream from her fingers. The woman picked at her salad. It tasted flat, like fake food from a cheap window display. There were not many other customers in the restaurant, just a few scattered diners. Most of them were alone, but two silent couples sat diagonally opposite each other across the room. The geometry of their positioning bothered the woman, but she didn't know why. Her life these days was filled with such random and inexplicable fears. We have to go soon, she said, glancing at the man. He was staring at the child. I said, we'll have to go soon. Please notice me, she thought. Tell me I'm more than just your babysitter. He looked over in her direction. His eyes were wide and wet as if he were fighting tears. I know, he said, and smiled sadly. We can go soon enough. Give me a minute. His lean, handsome face promised more than he could ever give. The lighting in the place was giving her a headache. It was too bright, harsh, and unrealistic. She imagined it was similar to the lighting in hospital morgues where corpses were dissected beneath cold white bulbs. Panic welled up inside her. She looked again at the man. He was no longer looking at the child or out of the window. He was watching the other people in the room. One of his hands was a fist on the table. The other had balled up the wrapper from his sandwich. There were crumbs on his jacket cuff, but he'd failed to notice them. Nearly finished, she said to the child, a sense of urgency causing her to speak too loudly. The child had cream smeared on her upper lip. She licked it off. Almost, she said, distracted. Behind her, someone got up and walked across the quiet room. The footsteps were heavy. They belonged to a man. She turned around and glanced at him. He was young, perhaps in his late twenties, and wearing fashionable clothes with designer labels. He carried an iPad in one hand. The light on the machine was flashing. These were exactly the kind of things that tended to set the man off. People in designer clothing, flashy techno toys, a look of arrogance, a smile of dismissal, an educated accent, the list was endless. There were new triggers to add to the list every day. She looked over at the man. His eyes were dry. They were hungry. It was happening again, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. Don't, she said, reaching across the table to grab hold of his fist. Not here. Not this time. Not in front of the child. Let's leave. When he turned towards her, his face was flushed. His cheeks were mottled. His lips were damp with spit. He was grinding his teeth. When? 
She squeezed his hand. Not long now. Just hang on for a little while longer until she's finished eating. She could see the threat of violence in his eyes, as if a moment was suspended there, frozen forever. Just be good. He closed his eyes and bowed his head. Monsters, he muttered, more to himself than anyone else. They're fucking everywhere. I see them wherever we go. I know, baby. She looked again at the young man who had passed by. He was vanishing into a door marked Toilets. The man's shoulders were hitching. He was ready to blow. Gotta stop them all. Stop all the damn monsters. She had to make a quick decision to prevent the situation from becoming worse. She remembered the time when he'd assaulted two bystanders and wrecked a petrol station forecourt, trying to get at a middle-aged businesswoman in the passenger seat of a Ford Mondeo. All the attention it had drawn, their blurred CCTV photographs in the paper, their mad rush to change vehicles so that the police couldn't track them down. They'd been on the move ever since, driving at night, sleeping all day in cheap hotel rooms, eating their meals at overly lit, lonely little all-night places like this one. Crossing the country in a succession of different vehicles, each one picked up cheap at cash-only used car depots. But England was a small country. Soon they would run out of road. Then what would they do? Simply turn around and run the other way? She still didn't understand how they'd never been caught. We're riding our luck. Surely it must run out soon. Surely. Okay, she said, softly but firmly. Do it now. Do it quickly. He's in the bathroom. Nobody will see. The man looked up, smiled, and got to his feet. She flinched when he moved and hated herself for it. Each time this happened, another piece of herself broke away. Sometimes she thought the only reason she stayed with the man was because if she left, the rest of her would flake off like scabs of rust and there'd be nothing left. This relationship, this twisted dynamic, was the only thing keeping her alive. The man walked quickly and soundlessly across the restaurant. It never failed to chill her, the way in which such a large man could move with that kind of quiet grace. She tried to pretend she didn't see him quickly grab a knife from the cutlery tray on his way to the bathroom. Nobody noticed him as he followed the other man through the doorway. The door swung silently on its hinges. Come on, she said to the child. Eat up now, we have to go. The thought hit her that she could stand up now and run. Get away. Leave him behind. But where would she go, and who would she run to? She had nothing, there was nobody else, just the man and the child. Without them both, she would somehow feel less complete, less of a real human being. She'd been doing this so long that it had become what defined her. She belonged here with these people, in these places. It didn't take long. It never did. The man reappeared less than thirty seconds later. The door hadn't even stopped swinging. His eyes were shining, his jacket was undone, and as he approached the table she saw that his knuckles were bright red and raw. They'd be bruised in the morning. She would have to find somewhere on the road to get some ice to stop the swelling. He stood at the side of the table with a faraway look in his eyes, swaying ever so slightly on his heels. There were a few spots of blood on his jacket sleeve. He didn't seem able to focus, not yet. It always took a minute or two for him to snap back into the moment. She wondered where he'd left the knife, or had he slipped it into his pocket to carry with him. They were blunt, those knives. It would be difficult to cause any real damage. That's what she told herself. That's what she hoped. Back to the car, now. She grabbed the child's arm and pulled her gently to her feet. The remains of the donut fell onto the floor. They moved towards the door, the three of them together. A family. The man was once again in front. He pushed open the glass doors and held them while the woman and the child went through out into the night. She raised her eyebrows as she brushed past him. He nodded, confirming that the red mist had cleared. He looked like he was about to say something. 
I love you. But then he closed his mouth and looked away, ashamed. Even now, after all this time, he felt shame. That was part of the reason she still loved him and why she thought that he could be saved. The air outside was cold. The temperature had dropped dramatically during the short time they'd been inside. I didn't even finish my donut, said the child, pouting. They hurried across the car park and waited until the man unlocked the car. The woman's breath was a fine, white cloud. She bundled the child onto the back seat and strapped her in. They might have to drive at speed. She didn't want to risk the child being injured if they had an accident, like last time. A few weeks ago, after a visit to an all-night supermarket, he'd run the car off the road and into a drainage ditch. She'd told the doctors in A&E that the child had fallen off her bike. She didn't think they'd believed her. But they helped the child anyway, patching her up and sending them both away with orders to return for a checkup in a week's time. By the time she climbed into the passenger seat, the man was already at the wheel, gunning the engine. Will it ever end? He said, staring through the windscreen. I don't think I can keep doing this. There's too many of them. I have to stop putting you through this, both of you. She placed a hand on his thigh. The muscles were rock hard. She rubbed the dry palm of her hand against the rough leg of his jeans. Oh, no, she said. We have to keep on hoping that the next one will be the last. He closed his hand over hers, but it didn't feel the same. It was like a ghost hand or a chill breeze touching her fingers for a second before moving away. They pulled out of the small car park and followed the exit road, joining the motorway about a half mile further along from the point where they'd left it. The child was already asleep as they crossed over into the fast lane to overtake a large truck. The woman turned her head and looked into the truck's cab. There was a light on in there. It seemed to fill the entire space, a pulsing entity. The truck driver's face was soft and kind. He had a short, neat beard and small blue eyes. He was singing along to a song on the radio. She stared at his mouth, trying to lip-read the lyrics. She wished she knew the name of the tune. It seemed important, somehow, the answer to a riddle that might change everything. When the truck driver realized that he was being watched, she turned her face away from his gaze. She felt him staring at her through two layers of glass as they pulled ahead of the truck and drifted back into the slow lane. He flashed his lights, but the man either didn't notice or chose to ignore the gesture. Her hand was still resting on the man's wide thigh. He was too hot for comfort. She took her hand away and pushed it between her knees. She was cold. She was always cold. She wondered if it was warm inside the cab of that truck. They drove on into the sodium-spattered darkness with no destination in mind. Traffic was light. The stars were silver pinpricks in the black night sky. Wherever they went, the man encountered monsters, and he tried his best to wipe them out. It was what he did, what he was compelled to do. He knew of no other way to put out the fire that raged in his veins, the flame that burned him up inside. One question had always haunted her. What if it's true? What if they really were monsters? She looked down at her lap, at her hand gripped between her knees. I am not my husband's keeper. I'll never be able to change him. The thought rattled around inside her head, becoming less than an echo of a truth she'd always avoided. The woman realized that eventually she'd have to stop him rather than going along with his moods and trying to curb his violent outbursts. Even if these poorly stage-managed incidents were all that stopped him from losing his mind completely and hurting her and the child, she knew that she was wrong to allow it. One day, she would have to put an end to this. She would have to, because if she failed to do so, then she must surely be as insane as him. When that day came, she hoped that she could shield the child from further harm. She loved the man, but she thought she loved the child more. And on nights like this one, when the man's blood was boiling, she was certain of the task ahead of her. She glanced over at the man. He was looking directly into her face, as if he was able to read her thoughts. He wasn't smiling. 
His hands gripped the steering wheel so hard that his knuckles had turned white. What were you looking at back there? His voice was steady and even. A gun, she thought. I'll need a gun. Nothing, she said. I was just staring into space. She braced herself for a slap, but it didn't come. That man in the truck. I think he was one of them. I think he was a monster. His voice was a whisper. She didn't say a word. Where can I get a gun? On the back seat, the child stirred, ready to wake. She yawned loudly. Lights flared in the rear window. The truck she'd seen earlier was approaching at speed. When it overtook them and shifted back over into their lane just ahead of them, a strange smile crossed the man's face. He put his foot down to keep up with the truck, as if he were chasing it. His features had hardened, a likeness carved in stone. She wondered if this would ever end, or if it would be her life forever. The road stretched ahead of them, as if in reply to her question. They were racing towards another bright dawn and following a trail of monsters. Maybe tomorrow, she thought, not for the first time and certainly not for the last. Maybe tomorrow I'll stop him. Up ahead, the brake lights on the truck turned red. Beside her, the man pulled the knife he'd taken from the tray in the restaurant out of his pocket. She closed her eyes and tried to think of nothing. The House on Ashley Avenue by Ian Rogers 1. Charles and Sally pulled up to the house at a quarter of eight. They sat in the car, basking in the air conditioning and the picture postcard view before them. It was one of those perfect Toronto summer evenings, with the setting sun bathing everything in a rich orange glow. Ashley Avenue looked as if it had been dipped in bronze. Charles turned off the ignition and shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Sally glanced down at the bulge in his pants pocket. You okay down there? she asked. Charles ignored her. Let's go, he said gruffly and opened his door. Sally smiled devilishly to herself and opened hers. The humidity hit her like a physical force. She felt invisible hands press against her chest and force the air out of her lungs. A warm breeze buffeted her bare arms and legs. It was only the middle of June, and Environment Canada had already issued half a dozen Humidex warnings. A lawn-watering ban was in effect, but you wouldn't have known it to look at the verdant lawns on Ashley Avenue. The only exception was the one at number 17. It was dead as the people who had lived inside. Sally looked up and down the street. According to Charles, who had become her de facto tour guide since she had moved to the city a year ago, they were in Rosedale, one of Toronto's most affluent neighborhoods. Occupied by the sort of personage who could get away with ignoring a citywide lawn-watering ban without getting fined, or who could easily afford to pay it if they did. Number 17 stood at the end of the street, next to an overgrown lot that looked as if it might have been a Little League field once upon a time. Sally could just make out the diamond-shaped remnants of the baselines. The house itself was a large, two-story dwelling with a wraparound porch and a tall elm in the front yard. A set of flagstones made a path to the porch. The Westons had died here four days ago, but one would never have known it to look at the place. There was nary a police cruiser or piece of crime scene tape to be found. Sally wasn't surprised. The residents of Rosedale paid for a great many things here, but she didn't think scandal was one of them. Unassuming, isn't it? Sally shrugged. Looks like any other house on the block, except for the lawn. Just remember what it really is, Charles said. How did Jimmy put it? Sally smiled thinly. He called it the architectural equivalent of a great white shark. Charles frowned. Not entirely accurate, but close enough at any rate. It doesn't look dangerous, Sally remarked. Did you expect it would? She gave the house a long, considering look, then said, No, I 
I don't know what I expected. Expect nothing. Charles' voice was calm and collected, but Sally thought she heard something else underneath, nervousness. Don't allow your mind to focus on any one part of it. If you start to feel funny, close your eyes and imagine you're walking a tightrope. Think only of keeping your balance. Sally glanced down at her shoes, a pair of high heels she had purchased earlier that day. That shouldn't be too hard. Charles heard the wry note in her voice and gave her an appraising once over. You'll do fine. You look great. Just hang back and let me do most of the talking. Sally nodded and looked at the house again. One of the eight, she thought. I can't believe I'm really going inside one of the eight. After smoothing down his tie and checking his suit for wrinkles, Charles finally opened the waist-high gate and started up the flagstone path. Sally followed. She found it was easier to not look at the house if she was moving. She needed all of her concentration to keep from falling down and busting an ankle. She wasn't used to wearing heels, but today's assignment required professional attire. It wasn't a problem for Charles, who had probably popped out of the womb in a suit and tie. He always referred to his clothing by their manufacturer, his Armani suit, his sake tie, his Gucci loafers. Sally, on the other hand, wouldn't have known the difference between Donna Karen and Donna Summer. She tended to dress for comfort rather than style and thus owned nothing that qualified as professional attire. Charles reached the front door and Sally had to hurry to catch up. He knocked, and a moment later the door was opened by a young man who looked as if he had been sleeping in his business suit for the last couple of days. Mr. Weston? The young man nodded. Ted, Ted Weston, you're with the city? We're with the Mirrorville Group. Charles replied, an insurance company working on behalf of the city. Ted Weston nodded, but the vacant look in his eyes said he wasn't registering this new information. Please come in, he said and stepped aside. As she followed Charles across the threshold, Sally realized she had been holding her breath and let it out in a long exhalation. They were standing in a small foyer, Sally heard gentle sobbing to her left and looked into the dining room, where two women were sitting at a long mahogany table. The crying woman was thin, with mousy hair that looked as if it hadn't seen the business end of a brush in about a week. The other woman was short and fat and draped in a ridiculous orange sarong that, in Sally's opinion, made her look like an enormous beach ball. The fat woman was patting the thin woman's hand and muttering words of consolation. It's okay, let it out. Normal to feel this way. It was hearing the fat woman's platitudes that helped Sally get over the initial shock of being inside the house on Ashley Avenue. Watching the metronomal rise and fall of her meaty paw as she patted the crying woman's hand had the effect of a hypnotist's command, snapping her out of a daze she didn't remember entering. From behind her, Ted said, That's my sister, Dawn. She... she hasn't been so good. That's understandable, Charles said. This is not a good time. We apologize for this intrusion. Ted led them into the dining room, clearing his throat to announce himself to the two women. Excuse me, Miss Morningside. The fat woman stood up and gave Charles and Sally a cool, appraising look. Then she reached into her pocket, took out a business card, and handed it to Charles. It said, Tanyanka Morningside, Spiritual Consultations and Communications. You are also family of the departed? Morningside inquired. My name is Charles Courtney, and this is my partner, Sally Wakefield. Sally raised her hand and wiggled her fingers in a small wave. We're insurance investigators with the Mirville Group. We're here on behalf of the city. Investigators, the psychic said suspiciously. I don't understand. You're investigating me? Not at all. The police informed us of the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Weston. One of the detectives mentioned that the children of the deceased were concerned about the circumstances surrounding the death of their parents and had decided to pursue, how shall I say, 
alternative avenues of investigation. The psychic seemed to inflate with rage. If you're implying that I'm... Charles held up his hand, cutting off her words. I'm not implying anything, Mrs. Morningside. We're not here to interfere, just to observe. The psychic's face became infused with color. I am a... I have worked with police on several occasions. Charles' lips spread in a warm grin. Then we shouldn't have any problems. I still don't understand why you're here. Mrs. Morningside, if I may speak frankly. Charles raised his hand, placed the first and second fingers to his lips, and cleared his throat. You're here, I presume, to contact the spirits of the deceased persons in this house in the hope of better understanding the circumstances under which they died. I will go one step further and say that you are probably operating under the assumption that this house is haunted. The psychic started to speak, and Charles cut her off a third time with his upraised hand. The Mirville group has no interest in the supernatural. That includes communicating with the dead or investigating haunted houses. We are perfectly neutral in this matter. But one thing our client, the city, does care about is Rosedale. If you yell shark at a beach, everyone runs out of the water like their asses are on fire. If you yell haunted house in a neighborhood such as this, a lot of people are going to be placing calls to their friends on the city council. Are you starting to see things from where I'm standing? Yes, I think I do, Morningside said. You're talking about covering up what happened here. She crossed her arms defiantly. I don't care if you're here on behalf of an insurance company, the city of Toronto, or the king of Siam. I am here on behalf of these people. She gestured grandly to Ted and Don Weston. Charles clapped his hands together like a teacher calling the attention of his class. Fine, okay, I didn't want to do it this way, but here goes. He cleared his throat in a theatrical manner. Since Mr. and Mrs. Weston are deceased, the house is once again the property of the city. As representatives of the city, Miss Wakefield and myself have more right to be here than anyone. Now, while I wouldn't dream of telling Ted or Don Weston to vacate these premises, I feel I must tell you, Miss Morningside, that the Yellow Pages are full of psychics. And if you have a problem with us being here, then I'm sure we can find someone else in your line of work who would be more... Accommodating. The psychic stared into Charles's icy blue eyes for a long time. Her cheeks were very red. A thin glaze of sweat had formed on her forehead. I need to work in absolute silence, she said finally. Charles exchanged a look with Sally. We won't say a word. The psychic looked at them both steadily. Sally ran an invisible zipper over her lips. Not a peep, she said. Fine, the psychic said. Let's begin. Two. They sat around the mahogany dining room table. No one said a word. They were all watching the psychic. They weren't clasping hands, but Sally figured it was only a matter of time. The table was astringently bare under the glow of the single overhead light fixture. It made Sally think of old gangster movies. Stool pigeons sitting in bleak interrogation rooms while grizzled, chain-smoking cops paced back and forth. The psychic stared around the table at them with dull, heavy-lidded eyes. She looked as if she were about to go into a trance, or maybe she was trying to remember if she unplugged the iron before she went out. Finally, she pulled a pen and a sheaf of blank paper out of a satchel bag on the floor next to her chair and placed them on the table before her. Clear your minds, she intoned. Sally thought, that shouldn't take you very long. And the psychic's head snapped back as if she had been slapped. She stared at Sally. Sally looked back with innocent surprise, an expression she had down pat. She practiced it in front of the bathroom mirror in her apartment. A slight widening of the eyes, a rising of the eyebrows, a gentle tilt of the head. Oh, goodness, is something wrong? 
Charles gave her a sidelong look and kicked her foot under the table. Sally couldn't help it. She had an impish side to her personality that seemed to embody that age-old maxim, the one that said you can dress them up, but you can't take them out. She liked to think that was part of the reason she had been recruited, besides her other, less tangible qualities. A slight breeze blew across the table and rustled the papers in front of the psychic. The spirits are with us, she said. Or someone left a window open, Sally thought. Charles was watching her intently. He shifted in his seat and the object in his pocket bumped against his groin. He groaned inwardly. The psychic closed her eyes, picked up the pen, and began to draw a series of loops. When she came to the end of the page, she dropped down to the next line and began again, as neat and orderly as the copy from a teletype machine. Sally had witnessed automatic writing on a few other occasions and recognized this kind of behavior. Drawing loops was a sort of psychic holding pattern. It was supposed to keep the writer in a trance-like state until they began to receive messages from the other side. The supernatural equivalent of a secretary taking dictation from her boss. With her eyes still firmly shut, the psychic began to speak. I am addressing the entities residing in this house. If you are with us tonight, please give us a sign. The house was silent for a long moment. Then, from somewhere close by, there came a loud thump. It sounded as if something heavy like a sandbag, for instance, had been dropped on the floor. Good, the psychic said, satisfied. The pen in her hand continued to execute an endless series of barrel rolls. She's certainly the tidiest automatic writer I've ever seen, Sally thought, much neater than the one who used crayons and construction paper. Please identify yourself, the psychic said. Tell us your name. They all watched as the pen jerked in the psychic's hand, dropping down to the bottom of the page. It spun around in a double loop and made a cursive letter B. This was followed by an R, I, T. Jesus, Ted muttered. Dawn crammed a fist against her mouth, stifling a cry. Charles and Sally stared expressionlessly. The psychic seemed oblivious to what her hand was doing. Her eyes were still closed and her brow was wrinkled in deep concentration. Her hand paused for a moment, then began again, writing with a flourish, leaping from one perfectly executed letter to the next. It was like watching a spider spin a web in fast forward. When she was finished, the psychic dropped the pen and let out a gasping breath. The others at the table leaned over to read the final message. Charles shot Sally another sidelong glance, while Ted and Dawn looked on with matching expressions of consternation. Charles looked up from the piece of paper to the psychic's own startled face and said, If this is some sort of joke, Miss Morningside, I don't think anyone at this table finds it very funny. Four pairs of eyes bore into the psychic. She seemed to shrink under their collective glare. In her voluminous orange sarong, she looked like a gas planet undergoing some catastrophic gravitational implosion. Finally, she looked down at the words on the paper. Her eyes sprang open and she gave out a small squeak. I don't understand, she said. I, I... I think your work is done here, Ted said, rising out of his chair. Please leave. The psychic's chubby cheeks turned red again, out of embarrassment this time rather than anger. N no, this isn't right. I've... I've consulted on dozens of police cases, police cases, hundreds of them. I have an 85% accuracy rating. Whatever that means, Sally thought. The psychic looked at Sally again as if Sally had spoken aloud. It's not my fault, she protested. There was interference, yes, interference. She latched onto the words like a drowning woman latching onto a life preserver. Interference from the house! 
The psychic reached out to Dawn, but Charles was suddenly there, gripping the psychic's upper arm and lifting her out of her chair. She tried to pull away, and the strap of her sarong slipped off her shoulder. Her chair screeched across the hardwood floor and fell over. You heard, Mr. Weston. Your work here is done. With his free hand, Charles picked up Morningside's satchel bag. The psychic glowered at them each in turn as he directed her toward the door. Sneaks, she hissed. You're all a bunch of dirty, rotten sneaks. Thank you for coming out tonight, Miss Morningside, Charles said as he stuck the psychic's bag in her hand and ushered her out the door. Your insight was most educational. Good night. The psychic opened her mouth to reply, but Charles had already closed the door on her. He went back into the dining room, experiencing a momentary sensation of deja vu as he saw Sally standing over Dawn and patting her hand. The difference was that Sally was the real deal. I'm so embarrassed, Dawn fretted. I can't believe I brought that woman here into my parents' house. I feel like I've polluted this place. This place was polluted long before your parents moved in, Charles wanted to say, but didn't. You had questions, Sally said, and that woman claimed to have the answers. There's nothing embarrassing about wanting to know the truth. Dawn wiped her nose on her sleeve and nodded reluctantly. But sometimes you have to come to terms with the fact that the truth may not be altogether satisfying. Dawn looked up at her with roomy eyes. What truth? she asked. That there is no mystery. Sally gave her hand a reassuring squeeze. As much as you might hate to admit it, your parents were the victims of a terrible accident. But accidents don't have reasons. They just happen. But I've heard stories about this house, Dawn said. I've heard... Sally squeezed Dawn's hand again, cutting off the other woman's words. I know, she said. We've heard them too. That's why we're here, remember? Every neighborhood has its haunted house. The one where bad things happened. The one kids cross the street to avoid. Even in a place like Rosedale. But they're just stories. There are no secrets here, no hidden truths, and no answers. She picked up both of Dawn's hands and placed them in her lap. You don't need to like it. It's a shitty deal. But you need to try and accept it. Dawn nodded. But it was a perfunctory gesture. She wasn't going to be accepting this, not today or tomorrow, maybe not ever. I need some air she said, springing out of her chair and almost knocking it over. I'm going for a walk. Then I want to leave this place and never come back again. Sally nodded and looked over at Ted. He stepped forward, took his sister's arm, and led her outside. When they were gone, Sally took out the psychic's business card. Tanyanka, is that Russian? Charles said, If she's Russian, then I'm winning the poo. Sally tore the business card in half and dropped it on the floor. Charles wandered over to the table and turned the pile of papers around so he could read the psychic's message. Brittany Spears, he said dubiously. Sally shrugged. Projecting at that woman was like throwing rocks at the side of a barn. She gave you a look. Sally shrugged. I goosed her, she said, to see if she was a receiver. Was she? Sally tilted her head from side to side. Yes and no. Yes and no, Charles said, pretending incredulity. The psychic is giving me a yes and no answer. What a scam. Fuck you, Sally said amiably. So was she? Eighty-seven percent of the world's population are receivers, Charles but less than 0.01% are tried and true psychic. This particular woman was a receiver, of that I have no doubt, but beyond that it's hard to say. I suspect she has something, or else I wouldn't have been able to influence her automatic writing. But she doesn't have much, and she doesn't know how to use it. An unschooled talent, Charles said, staring thoughtfully out the window at the darkening street. Is it worth informing the group? 
Couldn't hurt to put her on the watch list, Sally said. But she's too old to train. You've got to get them when they're young. She fluttered her eyes coquettishly. That just leaves the house, then. Charles went out to the foyer. He looked down the central hall to the kitchen, then up the stairs to the second floor. Do you pick up anything? Nope, Sally replied. Safe as houses. She raised an eyebrow devilishly, but Charles ignored the comment. One time she had asked him if his sense of humor had been surgically removed as a child. Charles had looked at her blankly and said he would have to get back to her on that one. But I probably wouldn't feel anything anyway, she went on. These places have triggers, right? Something that sets them off and makes them go all Amityville on people? It doesn't matter, Charles said. Things are winding down. No one's going to live here ever again. No one should have been living here in the first place. Check. He went over to the window to see if Ted and Dawn were coming back, but the street was deserted. The arc sodium street lights had come on, washing Ashley Avenue in a sickly jaundice color. Matters are being corrected as we speak. The agent who sold the house to the Westons will be found. Sally pictured an overweight, unshaven man in a piss-yellow suit with dark circles under his eyes and sweat stains under his arms. A man on the run, and with good reason. They're going to string that bastard up by his balls when they find him, Charles said, for starters. If they find him. They will, Charles said confidently. They put the snoops on him, and they've never come back empty-handed. Sally hugged herself, thinking of the snoops, but not picturing them. She had never seen them and never wanted to. So you don't pick up anything? Charles asked. From the house? Sally placed her hands against the small of her back and stretched. I don't know, she said. I could take a quick look around before we leave. No way, Charles said firmly. Once the Westons get back, I'm locking the door and we're out of here. And if we never see the inside of this place again, we should count ourselves lucky. Come on, Sally cajoled. This is one of the eight. I've never been in one before. Have you? No. Charles licked his lips. There's a reason no one lives in any of these places. You'd do well to remember that this is not a house. It's a slaughterhouse masquerading as a house. Sally wandered into the living room. It had been decorated in a style she thought of as Toronto trendy. Imitation antique wood furniture, Robert Bateman prints on the walls, and an honest-to-goodness wood-burning fireplace that looked as if it had never been used. A living room straight out of the country living section of the Pottery Barn catalog, designed for those who had not spent any significant amount of time in cottage country but who wanted visitors to their home to think they did. I can't see the harm in taking a quick walk around. I won't touch anything. Charles shot her a look. If you knew what this place was capable of, you'd know how stupid you sound right now. He pursed his lips. This house has been empty for over sixty years. Exactly one day. He raised his index finger. After the Westons moved in, they were killed. I'm not talking about moving in. I'm just talking about a quick tour. Charles paced back and forth in the foyer. Through the leaded glass panes in the front door, he saw Ted Weston standing out on the porch. They're back, he said brusquely. I'm going outside to have a quick smoke and get rid of them. Why don't you come out with us? No, thanks, Sally said. Nicotine screws with my biorhythms. Bullshit. Charles said, and opened the door. Make it quick, and don't touch anything. Sally gave him a two-fingered salute and went up the stairs. 3. When Charles stepped outside, Ted was sitting on the porch steps and smoking a cigarette. He had taken off his suit jacket and loosened his tie. I'm worn out, he said, scrubbing one hand down the side of his face. It's official. It's allowed, Charles said, sitting down next to him. He produced a gilt cigarette case from an inside pocket, took out a cigarette, tamped it. You have my permission. Thanks, 
Ted produced a lighter and lit Charles's cigarette. Then he leaned back on his elbows and let out a deep sigh. What a day. Charles looked around for Dawn, but didn't see her. She wanted to be alone, Ted said by way of explanation. Charles stood up and went down the steps to the flagstone path. He found himself conscious of making direct contact with the house and avoided it whenever possible. Heading out tonight? He asked. 11.15 back to Calgary, Ted said, exhaling smoke. Would have left this morning if Dawn wasn't so set on hiring that so-called psychic. That was her idea? Charles asked. Ted looked slightly offended. Sure wasn't mine. But it's not her fault, not entirely. The neighbors were on her the moment we got here, whispering about haunted houses and spooks. Charles put his hand in his pocket. Why do you think she was so quick to believe it? Ted held his cigarette between his thumb and forefinger and stared at the smoldering tip. Your partner got it exactly right, Mr. Courtney. What happened to my parents was an accident. A strange, fluky accident, but an accident nonetheless. I can accept that, but Dawn can't. Or won't. But why blame the house? Charles wondered. Of all the possible explanations she could have gone with, why pick one with a rather unbelievable angle? Ted shrugged. Because they had just moved into it, I guess. We both thought it was kind of strange how fast they sold the old place and bought this one. A house in this neighborhood is usually considered a steal, Charles offered. They don't come up that often. Yeah, that's what I figured, too. But the thing is, they didn't even tell us they were looking. They never said a word to us, and Dawn and my mother talked on the phone every Sunday. Last week, Dawn calls me and says our parents got a sweet deal on a house in Rosedale. They closed escrow in a week. Before I became a criminal lawyer, I used to deal in real estate law, and I never heard of anyone closing escrow in a week. Charles said, It's strange, but not completely unheard of. I know, Ted said, and that's why I'm willing to accept what happened. I don't like it, but I'm not about to blame their deaths on ghosts. He gave Charles a long, steady look. Of course, that doesn't exactly explain why you're here, though. It doesn't? You said you came to protect the reputation of the neighborhood. You don't want some psychic for hire going to the newspapers saying a house in Rosedale is not only haunted but responsible for the deaths of two people who were living there at the time. But if that's true, then why was it the neighbors who put Dawn onto the idea in the first place? Wouldn't it have been in their own best interest to keep their mouths shut? Charles looked down at his shoes, pretending to give the matter serious thought. I think some people can't help but talk. Tongues like to wag. Ted continued to look at Charles with that steady look in his eyes. You might be right, he said finally. The fact remains that only two people know what really happened in that house, and both of them are dead. I don't like that either, but that's the way it is. Charles smoked his cigarette and said nothing. They heard the clicking of Dawn's shoes as she came down the sidewalk. She stepped up to the front gate, but didn't pass through it. Ready? she asked. Yeah, Ted turned to Charles and offered his hand. Thank you for stopping by. Good luck with your investigation. Have a good flight, Charles said. He watched them drive off. When they were out of sight, he took the object out of his pocket. It was an old, scuffed baseball. Part of the red waxed stitching had come loose, and a flap of the nicotine-colored rawhide hung loose. To Charles, it looked like the dried scalp of a shrunken head. The letters T-R-T, -T, faint but legible, were printed on the side in childish block letters. The baseball had come from the Mirville Group's private collection of paranormal artifacts. It had been found in the house after the group took ownership in 1944. Jimmy Dunfries, one of the whiz kids in R&D, the same Jimmy who called 17 Ashley Avenue the great white shark of haunted houses, thought it might be an apor, a solid object which seemingly appears out of nowhere. Its significance, if it had one, was unknown. Charles had signed it out that morning and it was due back by midnight. If it wasn't returned, 
The Snoops would be paying him a visit, right after they caught up with Dustin Haney. Haney was the real estate agent who had sold the house to the Westons, except Haney was no more a real estate agent than Charles and Sally were insurance investigators. They all worked for the Mirville Group, on the surface an ordinary multinational insurance company, below the surface, a clandestine organization with interests in paranormal research. In addition to their various projects and investigations, the group was also the caretaker of a handful of properties that were known collectively as the Eight. Over the years, with the assistance of individuals on the city council, they had managed to keep the properties secure, maintained, and off the real estate markets. The house on Ashley Avenue was not the most dangerous of the eight. That honor belonged to an old fish processing plant on Lakeshore Boulevard, but it was certainly the most attractive. As the operative in charge of visiting the house on a weekly basis and making sure it hadn't gone Amityville on anyone, to use Sally's phraseology, Haney would have been familiar with the neighborhood and known how valuable the property would be to a couple who didn't know its dark and bloody history. The real question was, why did Haney do it? The group was still trying to figure that part out, but Charles knew they weren't really interested in the answer. What was done was done. They had learned a few facts. That a listing for 17 Ashley Avenue had appeared on three real estate websites over the past two weeks, that the name attached to the listing was one Dustin Haney, and that Haney stopped coming to work five days ago, which also happened to be the day the Westons closed escrow on their new home. Charles wished he could have told Ted and Dawn the truth. He took no pride or pleasure in lying to people, though he acknowledged it was a necessary part of his duties. But the truth wouldn't give them closure. It would probably have the opposite effect. It would have acted like a battering ram to the fragile doors of perception, and once those doors were open, it was impossible to close them again. Charles knew this from personal experience. On the other hand, he felt not even an inkling of sympathy for Haney. It was hard to feel for a man who had taken advantage of a retired couple who wanted nothing more than a home in which to spend their twilight years, twilight years which had turned out to be twilight days, the group's think tank were still scratching their heads over Haney's motive, but Charles figured it was because they were looking too deeply. He was willing to bet Haney had been motivated by nothing more than simple greed. Why he thought he could outrun and outwit the snoops was the real question. As these thoughts raced through Charles's mind, he discovered his feet had carried him around to the back of the house. From here, he could see down into the Don Valley and the dark, sprawling expanse of the old brickworks. With its sooty brick and spire-like smokestacks, it would have made a better haunted house than the house on Ashley Avenue. But looks are deceiving, aren't they, Charles, my boy? Oh, yes. In fact, that was the first thing they taught you at the Mirville Group. It could have been their slogan. He bounced the TRT baseball in his hand and stared down into the valley of dark, twining shapes and rustling leaves. He had meant to give the ball to Sally before he left the house, but Ted Weston had picked that moment to show up on the porch, and then Sally was already up the stairs. And here you are, still outside, while she's inside. Charles clutched the ball in a death grip. The voice in his head had managed to do what a half an hour in the house had been unable to accomplish. It had scared him. Here he was, promenading around the yard while Sally was inside, inside the house. He started back at a quick trot. By the time he reached the front yard, he was running. 4. Sally was twenty years old when she was recruited by the Mirville Group. On that particular day, she had been standing outside the red and white general store in Antigonish, drinking an orange crush. She looked up when the car with the Hertz sticker in the corner of the windshield pulled into the gravel parking lot and the man in the expensive suit stepped out. Not Charles. She didn't meet him until a month later, when she began the group's year-long training program in Toronto. This man, who moved not toward the store, but directly over to where Sally was standing, introduced himself as Edward Reed, 
and then proceeded to ask if she had given any thought to her career. Sally had stared at Edward Reed for a long moment. Next he's going to ask if I ever thought of being a model. She had heard stories about strange men who approached girls and offered them work as models. Unfortunately, most of those men turned out to be El Pervos who were interested only in girls willing to take off their clothes. Of course, they didn't tell you that up front. Oh, no. First, they had to butter you up, tell you how beautiful you are and how much money you could make, and so easily. That thought was going through Sally's mind as she reached out to shake Edward Reed's hand. The moment they touched, it was jerked out of her mind. She jerked her hand back, too, and was replaced with a sudden and inexplicable amount of knowledge about the man standing before her. His name isn't Edward Reed. It's Winter. Dan Winter. Daniel Clarence Winter. He's 38 years old, he lives in Barrie, Ontario, and he's left-handed. Once, in his senior year of high school, he cheated on a trig final. Sally dropped her orange crush and stared agog at Dan Winter, a.k.a. Edward Reed. It was a calculus final, actually, Dan Winter said. But you were close. Sally continued to stare. She'd had episodes like this one before, but never one so strong, so intense. Mr. Winter told Sally what was by then clearly evident. She was a telepath. Then he asked her again if she had given any thought to her career. Sally had replied in her mind, My career as a telepath? Dan Winter grinned at her. Yes. And the rest, as they say, is history. A year later, Sally had finished the psychic's equivalent of preparatory school and was given her first assignment, bloodhound work at Pearson International Airport. Using her wild talent, she picked out potential recruits from the crowds of people departing and arriving. She had only been there a week before the group pulled her out. They were concerned that in the wake of 9-11, airport security would be on high alert and that it was only a matter of time before someone noticed that Sally was never meeting anyone or taking any flights herself. So they sent her to the mall, five of them, to be precise, on a rotating monthly schedule. Same assignment, sniff out potential psychics for the Mirville group. Sally did that for six months, spending her days pretending to window shop, eating her meals in greasy food courts. She put on 15 pounds and staying under the radar of mall security, who were not nearly as astute as their brethren at the airport. The group called this sort of work trawling. Sally called it boring. When Charles had come to her with the Ashley Avenue assignment, Sally had done more than jump at it. She had pole vaulted over it. Anything to get her away from the mind-numbing Muzak and the El Pervos in the food court, who seemed to come not so much to eat as to ogle the teenage girls. Looking up at the house on Ashley Avenue for the first time, Sally had wondered if she hadn't bitten off more than she could chew. But now, as she walked aimlessly through the rooms on the second floor, she found herself feeling strangely relaxed, almost at peace. It was not the sort of feeling she would have expected to feel in a place with the reputation that 17 Ashley Avenue had. Instead, she was experiencing the same kaleidoscopic mix of emotions she had felt on her first days in the group's training facility, a heady cocktail of curiosity, excitement, and nervousness. She wanted to do a good job here, because she took pride in her work, but more because she didn't want to go back to the mall. It was trite, but it was true. She'd had her fill of malls and was ready for something new, something marginally more exciting than trawling. And she hoped after today the group would feel the same way too. She considered opening her mind just a little bit to see if she could pick up anything from the house. But that probably wasn't a good idea. In fact, it might even be a bad idea. To do such a thing in a place like this was like raising your chin to Mike Tyson and saying, Come on, big boy, give me your best shot. 17 Ashley Avenue was not the heavyweight champion of haunted houses, but it probably still packed a wallop. Sally wandered into the bathroom where, according to the police report, Mr. Weston had had his accident. The mirror over the sink was gone, 
and she could see the contents of the medicine cabinet. This struck her as an invasion of privacy, and she averted her eyes, turning instead to the old-fashioned clawfoot tub. It was here that Mrs. Weston had found her husband covered in broken glass, his throat slit. The report suggested that Mrs. Weston had panicked at the sight, went to call 911, and fell down the stairs, breaking her neck. It was a good story, but Sally had a couple of problems with it. For starters, the report said Mr. Weston had been standing on the edge of the bathtub to hang a shower curtain and lost his balance. As he fell, he reached out blindly and grabbed the mirror over the sink, pulling it off its hinges. When he landed in the tub, the mirror shattered and a piece of it slit his throat. Sally supposed such a thing was possible, but not very likely. The part about Mrs. Weston going downstairs to call 911 didn't make sense either. If that's what she was really doing, why didn't she use the phone in the master bedroom? It was closer. She was scared. She panicked. Yes, and in her agitated state, she tripped over her own feet and fell down the stairs. Again, it wasn't an impossible scenario, but an extremely unlikely one. Sally went into the master bedroom. All of the furniture was draped with white sheets. Sally went over to a tall, slender piece, pulled off the sheet, and let out a frightened gasp when she saw her reflection in the gilt-framed mirror. The sheet caught on the bottom corner and rocked the mirror back on its feet. Sally reached out and caught it before it fell backwards. She didn't need seven years of bad luck, thank you very much. As she was replacing the sheet, she heard Charles in her head admonishing her, Don't touch anything. She stuck her tongue out at her reflection, which responded in kind. She flung the sheet onto the bed and went over to the window that looked out on the overgrown lot next to the house. From this vantage point, the diamond shape of the old baseball diamond was even more apparent. She turned to her left and took the sheet off the piece of furniture standing next to the window. It was an old vanity bench. It was beautiful. She didn't know anything about antiques, but it looked expensive. The wood was cherry and polished to a high gloss. Sally sat down on the bench and looked into the mirror. Another mirror. Mirrors all over the place. Two mirrors in the bedroom, a broken mirror in the bathroom. An idea came to her then, in much the same way as the one about opening her mind to the house had come earlier. Closing her eyes, she reached out and placed her hands on the surface of the mirror. Sometimes she could pick up impressions from inanimate objects. It was called psychometry, and the group held it in very high regard. The glass was cool under her hands. There was an abrupt cracking sound that Sally heard, not with her ears, but with her mind. A psychic sound. The crack of a bat. A baseball bat. Her eyes flew open. A whitish blur came flying in through the open window and struck the vanity mirror. There was another sound, the unmistaken crash of breaking glass, and Sally felt a sharp pain in her left eye. Her vision in that eye immediately turned red, as if a filter had been placed over it. She clamped her hand over it and felt something jagged and sharp cut into her palm. There was a piece of glass sticking out of her eye. She opened her mouth to scream, but all that came out was a dry squeak. She stood up, her hand still clamped over her eye, and tripped over the bench in her rush to escape the room and find help. She tried to keep her balance and probably would have succeeded if her foot hadn't come down on the baseball that had broken the mirror. Her foot went backward while the ball shot forward. Her legs were swept out from under her, prompting a sudden, strange association. Her airplane ride to Toronto. Her first airplane ride anywhere and the mechanical vibration as the landing gears were pulled into the main body of the plane. And then she was falling, falling face first onto the hardwood floor, the shard of glass sliding directly into her brain, killing her instantly. Sally took her hands off the mirror and opened her eyes. She wasn't blind or dead, but she was crying. Suddenly, she didn't want to sit here anymore. She didn't want to be in this house anymore. She stood up abruptly, knocking the bench over. She held her arms out for balance, then walked around it, give it a wide berth, 
and made a beeline for the hallway. Her attention was so focused on the bench that she didn't notice the gilt-framed mirror had inexplicably moved across the room, right into her path of travel. She saw it at the last moment, tried to dodge around it, but her foot clipped the bottom corner and sent it crashing to the floor. Sally swore and crouched down to pick it up. The frame was empty. All the glass was on the floor. As she stared at it, something strange happened. The pieces started to move. Not very much at first, but they were moving, as if the floor was vibrating and causing them to dance ever so slightly. Then one piece flew into the air and hung there. Another piece leaped up and joined it. Then another and another. Soon, glass was flying into the air like grease on a hot plate, joining the growing mass which hung there. The floor was bare in a matter of seconds, and a vaguely humanoid shape constructed of broken glass stood before her. It was a flat, dwarfish form with stumpy arms and stumpy legs. But there hadn't been that much glass to work with. Staring at the thing which had been a mirror until a few seconds ago, Sally was reminded of another wayward girl who had wandered into a place she probably should have left well enough alone. But she didn't think Alice had ever encountered a looking-glass creature like this one in her travels through Wonderland. It took a step toward her. Its foot made a crunching, tinkling sound on the hardwood floor. The overhead fixture sent wild flashes of light along the walls as it took another step toward her. Sally thought of Mrs. Weston and her trip down the stairs. She hadn't gone running for the telephone, Sally realized. She had been chased. Five. Charles ran around the side of the house and up the porch steps. He experienced a brief nightmare moment when he thought the front door was locked. But then he pushed instead of pulled and ran into the main foyer. He saw Sally lying on the floor at the top of the stairs. Her eyes and mouth were open wide in what was almost a burlesque of fright. It was an expression Charles had seen on a hundred horror movie posters, the terrified starlet cowering before the monster. Sally was no Julie Adams, but that was okay, because the thing standing over her was no creature from the Black Lagoon, either. It had a short squat body that seemed to be composed entirely of broken glass. As he watched, the creature swung one of its jagged hands in a glittering arc that opened a long red line on the palm of one of Sally's upraised hands. Charles's heart seemed to freeze solid in his chest. He clutched at his chest and realized he was still holding the TRT baseball. Then, without realizing what he was doing or why, he turned to his side, dropping his arm as he did so and leaned into a position he had seen a thousand times on ESPN. He adjusted his hold on the baseball, made sure he had a firm grip, and turned his head to the left, looking for the catcher's sign, he guessed. A half second later, the rest of his body started to turn. His arm came around last, snapping through the air in a whip-like motion that ended with the release of the ball. It shot through the air like a bullet fired from a gun, striking the glass creature dead center and exploding its strangely fragmented body into a thousand pieces. Shrapnel flew everywhere. Sally still had her hands raised and was able to protect herself from the worst of it. Charles raced up the stairs and looked her over. Three fingers on her left hand were sliced open and would require stitches. On her right hand, a piece of glass was embedded in the webbing between the thumb and index finger. Another piece was sticking out of her thigh. Can you walk? Sally nodded and took Charles's hand. He started to lead her down the stairs, but she stopped him and turned back around. She crouched down, teetering on her injured leg, and picked up the TRT baseball sitting amongst the broken glass. As her fingers made contact with the old raw hide, she saw a flash of images. The vanity, the open window, the scratch baseball game taking place outside. Kids hollering and laughing. Eddie's out! Eddie's out! The crack of a bat, followed by the crash of broken glass. Then everything turns red. The images faded away. Sally clutched the baseball to her chest, and for a moment, 
Charles thought she was going to start reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, or maybe a couple of verses of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. He took her arm again and led her down the stairs and out of the house. He put her in the car and fastened her seatbelt. She was trying to make herself pretty, Sally said in a low, dreamy voice. She gripped the baseball close to her chest and looked up at Charles. But she was never pretty again. She was never pretty again, Charles. Charles closed her door and went around to the driver's side. As he slipped behind the wheel, he realized he forgot to lock the door of the house. He took the key out of his pocket and ran with it outstretched in his hand to the porch. He locked the door and ran back to the car. As they pulled away from the house, Sally looked over at the overgrown lot. She clenched the baseball tighter. Her blood dripped across the old, cracked rawhide. The baseball didn't mind. It was like coming home. Dead Song by J. Wilburn The man walked into the dark room and closed the door behind him. He put on the headphones and sat down on the stool. Images of zombies flashed on the screen in front of him. He ignored them and opened the binder on the stand. He pulled the microphone a little closer and waited. In the darkness, a voice came over the headphones and said, Go ahead and read the title card again for us slowly so we can set levels. The man read with particular slowness and articulation. Dead Doc Productions presents The Legend of Tiny Mud Music Jones in association with Afterworld Broadcasters and Reanimate America, a subsidiary of the Reclaimant Broadcasters Company, with permission of the reformed United States Federal Government Broadcasters' Rights Commission. He waited silently after he finished. The voice finally came back on. Sounds good. We're going to get coverage on the main text for alternate takes. We're also going to have you read the quotes as placeholders until we get character actors to replace them. Read them normally without any affected voice. If we need another tone or tempo, we'll let you know and we'll take another pass at that section. There is also some new material we are adding into the documentary. Okay, the man answered. The voice ordered. When you're ready to go, go ahead with section one, then stop. The man took a drink of water, swallowed, and then waited for a couple of beats. He began. Dead World Records was one of the first music companies to come online after order was restored. They were recording and signing artists during the height of the zombie plague. Tobias Baker and Hollister Z are credited with founding the company. They operated from a trailer and storage building on Tobias's family farm, surviving off the land and clearing zombies from the property between recording and editing. A black and white image of zombie pits scrolled across the screen as the guys in the booth ran the images to check timing. The man ignored it. He continued. They do deserve credit for reorganizing the continued value of musical culture and history while everyone else was focused purely on survival. They had the vision to gather and record the unique musical evolution of the dead era which shaped all music that came after it. A grainy video of the men working in their studio rolled on the screen. The man stopped and watched as he waited. The video froze and the voice said, Skip to section four. The text is edited from the last time you read it. Read it over once and tell us when you are ready. The man obliged them by scanning it over. He said, Ready. The voice said, We're rolling on section four. The man took another drink before he began. The real unsung heroes of the rise of Dead World Records, Inc. are clearly the collectors that agreed to bring the recordings back to the studio. Many of them were musicians themselves and trekked hundreds of miles through zombie-infested territory to find musical gatherings of the various unique pockets of survivors. A picture of Tiny flashed on the screen with his name under it. He was wearing shorts, hiking boots, and holding a walking stick. A picture of another man wearing a helmet and carrying a bat replaced it. The name below it was Satchel Mouth Murder Man. The man continued. 
Music from this period is clearly defined by both isolation and strange mixtures of people and cultures. The gatherings of these musical laboratories, many of which were destroyed and long lost before zombies were, is the legacy of men like Tiny Mud Music Jones. Stills of Tiny with arrows pointing him out passed over the screen. The man read on. Tiny traveled farther and gathered more than any other collector. His introverted style and musical talent won trust and entry into enclaves of people no one else could penetrate. Some historians believe much of what we know of dead-era culture is built off the exploration of Tiny Jones. The man stopped. The voice ordered, Go with Section 6 when ready. The man began as soon as he had the page. Tiny was so named due to his four-foot, eleven-inch stature. Even Tobias Baker and Hollister Z didn't know him by any other name besides Tiny. He carried a pack, which looked heavier than him, with more instruments and recording equipment than food and clothes. He usually played for his supper and in turn got others to play for him with tape rolling. After a short pause, the voice said, Section 7 needs to have a foreboding tone. It's going to be over some heavy music. Articulate it well. Go when ready. The man read. He is also the source of the mud music legend, making three infamous trips into dead-era Appalachia in search of it. The voice said, Let's do that again. Try a little more flow, but a darker tone. The man read it again. The voice acknowledged. That was good. Go with section 10 now when you're ready. The man began. Tiny discovered Donna Cash whereabouts unknown. Donna Cash is the most quoted artist on the tribute wall on Survivor Book. Bootleg recordings of her work are still in the top 100 downloads each year. Donna Cash was best known for mashups of Madonna and Johnny Cash on the drag queen circuit. She was touring when doing so was deadly even for individuals not in drag. Tiny is responsible for the only known original recordings of True Folsom Blues, Vogue the Line, When the Ray of Light Comes Around, Like a Ring of Fire, and many other songs that have been covered thousands of times by both straight and drag acts in the recovery era. Donna Cash has also been documented more times on the missing person sighting wall on Survivor Book than any other person. Mr. S. Parker, the current CEO of Survivor Book, has put a permanent block on Donna Cash sightings. Other popular artists on the dead era drag circuit that were first recorded by Tiny included Pink Orbison, Miss Brit Brit Rotten, and Jerry Lee Lopper. The man stopped again and took a drink of water. The voice said, Let's go with section 14. The man scanned the first few lines before he started. Tiny Jones recorded examples of new swing from Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Cincinnati. The music was originally used as a distraction for zombies while scavengers went out into the cities for supplies. Traditionally, it is played on rooftops. New Swing is a blend of big band, modern jazz, 50s rock, and R&B. It is defined by a reverb off of buildings. Most modern New Swing musicians create the sound electronically. Tiny recorded P-City Warriors, The Big Bloods led by the late Cap Cat Crunch, and the new Philly Funk which still plays in Las Vegas with a new lineup. We let Tiny record after he fought his way to the building and knocked on the door holding two zombie heads in his hands. Would you say no to a cat that showed up like that? Miles Diddy, P-City Warriors original lineup. The man paused again. The voice asked, Do you need a break? No, I'm fine, the man answered. The voice said, Turn to section 21 and start from the third line on the end of that section. The man recited. Glam Grass was discovered outside of Nashville. A tour group of old 80s metal stars ended up in a militia compound with a religious cult. After the fire, Tiny's recordings were the only record of the founders of this musical form. It was defined by electric guitars accompanied by traditional bluegrass instruments. 
The glam grass artists usually sang about religious subject matter, often out of the book of Revelation. The style is described as typically heavy but surprisingly upbeat. The voice said, Now section 27. The man read, Across the South, a style known as death gospel emerged from places where churches became the refuge of non-believers. It was a movement where metal influence came against traditional hymns. Unlike glam grass, death gospel was darker, slower, featuring minor chords and was usually played acoustically. This style was documented by several collectors and is still a staple of churches in the Deep South. The voice directed, Section 29. The man turned one page and found his place. Tiny was involved in spreading the music and not just recording it. This is noticed most in the style known as Cherokee R&B or Red Blues. Tiny is credited with moving the music from North Carolina all the way to Oklahoma. The day he came to the fences, the zombies parted and allowed him through. He was the first white man admitted to the Cherokee Nation compounds. Chief Blue Wolf Pine, rhythm guitar and vocals, the silent dead players. With variations across the South and West, red blues included Native American chants, combined with traditional blues instrumentation and riffs. Later, red blues diverged more from this original formula. The later style was sometimes referred to as Blue Sioux. After a long pause, the voice came back and said, Section 35 has been rewritten. Start that from the beginning. The man read it silently, then began. Shockabilly was one of Tiny Jones's favorite collections. It featured shock rocker makeup, dark subjects, and punk-slash-country combinations. It was mostly advanced by touring acts. Tiny expressed that he felt a kinship with the traveling musicians. Shockabilly artists that stayed in one place were looked on as cowards within the community. Posers. The tour buses were often dragsters pulled by animals. There were competitions between the shockers to see who could get the most elaborate dragster. At one point, my band had the three-story Tar Mansion. It was built on the chassis of a tractor trailer that was pulled by 26 horses. It's a wonder we didn't get eaten by zombies trying to put on a show just traveling from point A to point B. Big Bubba Tarmancula, Big Bubba Tarmancula and the Tar Men, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Shockabilly t-shirts, tour posters, and images are infused in pop culture throughout the recovery era. The voice said, Read section 40 now. The man drank the rest of his water and then read, Several styles of urban infusion developed during the dead era and were all connected by and counter-influenced by one another through Tiny's travels. Gangster and Western was defined by rivalry as opposed to isolation. Vocals are considered more melodic than traditional BZ-era rap. There were often references to local blood feuds between ranches that don't make much sense to modern listeners. The ranchers herded animals for food and herded zombies between ranches to foil rustlers and to threaten rival ranches. The results were often quite bloody and costly to human life. Tiny was the only collector to ever go to certain sections of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. The most infamously violent ranch war was between Big Daddy Bronco and his boys versus the Lincoln County OGs. Tiny was the only one that succeeded in recording music from both camps. Hip Bach is the tag given to another style of music Tiny documented where inner-city orchestras and concert halls became the shelters for local populations. In all the history of time, you have never heard a style as close to God and as close to the street as this. This music allowed people to transcend the situation and see the secrets of life while being surrounded by the walking dead. Mr. Butterhands, Low Town Symphony. Tiny Jones often traced music back to its source, as he did with Slam Joe. Tiny traveled all the way to the Ludd Mine Camp in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Slam Joe featured spoken word over banjo. 
New Wave Slam Joe, documented by Tiny and other collectors, began to incorporate other instruments. Tiny Jones was a legend in the Zedhead community. He was deeply involved in documenting the evolution of this daring style of music, which mixed techno and house music over recordings of zombies. The most famous story of Tiny's involvement was the two weeks he accompanied DJ Ramzam out in the open in a gathering expedition through Los Angeles. Many fans question modern Zedhead since most DJs don't gather their own moan tracks anymore. The recent release of the alleged final recording of Tiny Mud Music Jones has resulted in a rebirth of the Zedhead movement. Border patrol forces and security have been increased to discourage Zedhead gatherers from attempting to perform unauthorized expeditions into uncleared gray zones. The voice clicked back into the headphones. You're doing a great job. Turn to section 64. This is all new material. The man turned the page. Go when ready, the voice requested. The man read. Tiny and the Mud Music Legend is the modern Area 51 Brown Mountain Lights and Kennedy assassination rolled into one. How do you tell a ghost story to a generation of people that either witnessed Z-Day and survived all the way to the recovery or that were born in the world after the dead era began? What are you going to say that can scare a generation that treats the zombie drills in school like a tornado drill? You can tell them about Tiny and the mud music. I hadn't stopped being scared since that day. Kid Banjo, former dead music records collector and solo artist. A map of the BZ-era United States with red lines drawing themselves across it appeared on the screen and distracted the man for a split second. But he found his place in the script and continued like a professional. The first expedition Tiny Jones made into the Appalachian Territory took him into the area that today roughly constitutes the border of Grey Zone 3. This collection exposed him to traditional mountain music, not unlike recordings from the early 1920s BZE, from the same area. Tiny described trailers with wooden add-ons and trinket trash, folk art he saw on the expedition that expressed the same style, character, and sentiment of the music that had managed to stay unchanged through a century and a zombie invasion. The map now had blue lines appearing and drawing deeper into the mountains. The man read, The second expedition into the infamous region known as Grey Zone 4 came back with a corrupted recording that could not be found later. Something was different about Tiny after that second trip. He was devastated by the recording being garbled. He had me and Hollis drop what we were doing and immediately sit down in a closed, locked room to play it for us. He had whispered the words, mud music, like it was something akin to voodoo. When it started out, it gave me chills because the sound was all fucked up and unearthly. I thought it was the music at first, because, of course, this was tiny and there was no telling what he might bring back. Then I saw him crying, like he had just watched his newborn child get torn apart by zombies. He was shaking and beating his fists against his head. Hollis had to hold his hands down to stop him. Believe it or not, that's the last time I ever saw Tiny. Tobias Baker, co-founder Dead World Records, Inc., Former CEO D.W. Farms. Deceased. Tiny was changed. He was the most enthusiastic lover of music I had ever known. He was tough as a block of oak. I believe every story I ever heard of him parting seas of zombies, cutting off their heads and carrying them in to impress musicians and walking right through them to find the music. He was fearless because he loved the music so much. After that trip, he was obsessed. He sat and listened to that recording over and over and over and over and over. After he left, we never found that recording again, but I still hear that shit in my nightmares because of him repeating it and repeating it those last few nights. He sat with his ear to the speaker, swearing that it was under the interference, that it was under that ruined recording. Then he said he heard the voices of the singers speaking to him. He tried to describe the instruments they built. I can't remember now, but I wish I had recorded him talking. I didn't know that when he left that last time that that was it. 
I would have tried to stop him if I had known. But he was Tiny Jones. I don't think I could have stopped him if I had tried. Hollister Z, co-founder Dead World Records, Inc. The man stopped and looked up to see a blown-out color photo of Tiny Jones leaning over with his ear to a speaker. When his headphones crackled, it made the man jump a little. The voice just said, Section 65. The man collected himself and began. He did not return from his third expedition. There were no other confirmed sightings either. Only Donna Cash has more unconfirmed sightings on Internet America. As witnessed by Tobias Baker and Hollister Z., Kid Banjo returned to the farm with a cassette he claimed was given to him by Tiny Jones. Kid Banjo was a collector for Dead World, and in the recovery era he rose to prominence as a shockabilly revival artist. Cassettes were not in common use at the time, and there are no other Tiny Jones recordings on a cassette tape. Kid claimed he was in the Fort Guilford colony in western Virginia near the North Carolina border. Somehow, Tiny had entered his room in the fort, had awakened him without disturbing the other men in the bunks, and had given him the tape without being detected by the guards either entering or leaving the heavily secure fort. Kid Banjo insisted it was Tiny and that he was covered in cuts and bruises. He told Kid to take it directly to DW Farms. He said it was the only way he could record it and get out. He said he had to go back, or they would know what he had done, and they would come looking for him. Kid asked who they were, but Tiny shushed him and left without answering. The following is an excerpt of the recording that was recently released by Dead World Records and has been heavily sampled in recent Z-Head tracts. Please be warned that the sounds are disturbing, including apparent zombie attacks and human screams. There is only one section that has distinguishable words near the end of the 38-minute, 20-second recording. The voice has not been definitively identified to be Tiny Jones. The two most common interpretations of this section you are about to hear is either the horror of it, they obey the mud music, death is beautiful, or the whores they obey, the mud music death is beautiful. The man stared at the words he had just read for a long moment. When he looked up, there was a black and white photo on the side of a trailer. There were painted words on the side which read, Don't come looking for us again or we'll come back for you. There was an arrow superimposed over the photo pointing at something under the words. The voice came back on and said, Section 66. The man turned the page and read on. The following vandalism was found on the trailer on the DW Farms property about a week after Kid Banjo delivered the cassette he claimed was from Tiny Jones. Hollister Z claims the medicine bag hanging from the nail at the bottom of the photograph contained a pair of human testicles, among other items such as teeth and fingernails. This was never confirmed, and there was no indication of whether or not Tiny died as a result of foul play or from any other cause. Other collectors did go into the Appalachian region in search of the secret of the last recording of Tiny Jones and the legendary mud music, despite the sinister warning. Those that claimed to know of the mud music told the collectors stories of mystical powers, including the power to tame or command zombies with it, of deals with the devil god of the walking corpses, and of the fact that the source was always to be found somewhere deeper in the hills. No other collectors were able to bring back any recordings of this legendary music either. The man stopped and saw a shot of a newspaper with a file picture of Tobias Baker under the headline, Dead World Records Exec Found Butchered in Gray Zone. The voice said, Section 67. The man actually said, When did this happen? The voice came back on. Stop there. I think you're in the wrong section. 67 starts with recently. See if you can find the spot again. The man turned the page. I have it. The voice began. Begin when ready. The man reached for his glass, but realized it was empty. He went ahead and started. 
Recently, Tobias Baker, co-founder of Dead World Records, Inc., was granted an unprecedented clearance for a manned expedition into Gray Zone 4, one of two uncleared areas deep in the Appalachian Mountains. Contact with radio and GPS were lost on the second day of the expedition. Aerial searches did not reveal the location of the expedition nor evidence to their whereabouts. Three days after the expedition was scheduled to end, Border Patrol claims seven men began approaching the gates from inside Zone 4. It wasn't until they were within ten feet and had not identified themselves that they were identified as zombies. The guards opened fire. The Border Patrol claims the zombies placed one severed head each on the ground by the gate. The seven zombies then returned to the woods despite taking heavy fire. Cameras at the gate malfunctioned before this alleged event, and sources asked to remain unnamed. Upon inspection, the seven heads proved to be zombified and active. Officials were called in. The heads were deactivated using surgical lasers. They were then placed in secure cases using robots. It has been confirmed that six of the heads belonged to the members of the ill-fated DWR expedition, including Tobias Baker. The seventh head, which was considerably more decayed and was missing all its teeth, has not. An unconfirmed rumor on Internet America claims the head is that of Tiny Jones. DNA samples are unavailable and the RUS agency involved has not commented. Hollister Z, co-founder of Dead World Records, Inc., has been unavailable for comment. The following is an unconfirmed voicemail recording that surfaced on Internet America two days before the heads were found. Be warned that this recording contains graphic details of decapitation and dismemberment. It is quite disturbing. The man stopped and looked up at a picture of a decayed, severed head in a thick plastic case. The voice began. Begin with section 68 when you're ready. I think I need a break. I'm out of water, the man said as he stared at the screen. There was a long pause. He was about to repeat his request when there was a click in his headphones and a drawn-out hiss of an open mic. He waited a little longer and then thought he heard distant whispers in the background. He listened as he looked at the severed head on the screen in front of him. Then a voice came on and said, When it is time, we will get you. The screen went blank, and the room was completely dark. What? The man asked with a rush of fear. The voice repeated, We will break for about ten minutes. When it is time, we will come get you. After another couple seconds, his eyes adjusted to the darkness in the room. The man removed his headphones and walked toward the door in the dark. Sleeping, I Was Beauty by Sandy Leibovitz The prince's eyes devour me in damask shawls and dancing shoes or morning's rumpled flannel. When my stocking tears, he bends to bus fresh bud of ankle flowering through the rip. Between one bite of saffron pheasant and the next, I try unsnarling the skein of words one hundred years of sleep have knotted up. But my husband's lips twist in distaste. He squints each time I speak, trying to imagine her back, that sleeping girl he loves, the mute. I woke to his face dark, over me, his weight stopping my breath, his cloak pressing thorns into my thighs, his tongue already busy in my mouth, and all the world rejoicing at true love's admittance. My throat grows dustier than my father's cobwebbed kingdom. Silence burns like the bonfire of wheels. All the while, my mind spins dreams of roses. Bajazzle by Margot Lanigan 
The Sheilas got on the train at Austinmere. Oh, no, said Don softly as they filed by, six or seven of them, to take the seats the school kids had just left. Bugger me gently. What? Sue did that old biddy thing, tipping her head back to peer through her glasses, then forward to peer over them. Bloody Sheilas, he muttered. Sue watched them settle their ragged, fraying layers of black clothing, their silence. All the talk had died down behind them, and Don heard the rest of the carriage notice and fall silent, too. Everyone sat poised a moment in the utter quiet after the guard's whistle. Then the train pooted and wrenched itself from the platform. Come on. He stood up and grasped the handles of the duffel bag. Sue didn't have chins, just some narrow pleats that gathered around her jaw when she pulled back like that. She raised an eyebrow, and the afternoon sunlight falling in from the top of the escarpment showed up every crinkle on her forehead. Don't be ridiculous, Don. It's five minutes. For the bother of tracking down another seat? Another pair of seats? Just sit down and weather it. Hand still on the duffel handles, he twisted to look at the Sheilas. They perched, as they always did, feet on the seats, hugging their legs. They turned their faces aside, but not with embarrassment. They just didn't give a toss about anyone else in the carriage. Sue had gone back to her Kindle. To Don's mind, there was no way to read off one of those things without looking smug. Ooh, look at me, I've got all of Jane Austen in here and everything Charles Dickens wrote, no bigger than a couple of CDs. I just love it. He sat down, fuming. He wished he'd had the courage to take their bag and go. But she was right, the train was packed. They would have made fools of themselves dragging along the aisles, bumping people with the duffel, tripping over feet and baggage and children. The Sheilas squatted motionless, all black rags and pale, made-up faces. Some of them went lipless, some painted on black mouths. This one here, facing away from him, had blacked out more than her lips. She'd painted a bigger, toothier mouth all the way up her cheeks. He gave a little laugh, heard the pain in it, and stopped. I knew we should have driven. Yes, said Sue. God, she was a bitch sometimes. She complained about his tone of voice and then farted out a sour note like that right under his nose. No, he wouldn't think about where that sourness came from. The road rage incident, as she called it very precisely. There was no point getting angry about that again. He sent a vicious gaze over the Sheila he could see best, the one who was facing him between the gap in the seats. She was one of the lipless ones. He leaned closer to Sue, muttered under the accelerating train rattle. Why would you do that? Do what? Sue re-angled the Kindle, as if worried his breath would mist over the screen. Make yourself so ugly. I mean, under all that gunk, you've got a perfectly nice-looking girl. Now Sue was giving him that bridling look. What? I don't know she said. Maybe you get sick of everyone expecting you to be decorative, pervy blokes on trains included. I'm not being pervy. I'm not expecting anything. Ah, forget it. Yes, good idea. Why don't you sit back and enjoy the scenery out the window? Such a bitch. He was close to saying it, if she hadn't delivered that mad rant that time against the word and the word being used about her in particular, he would have said it out loud. It didn't matter, she heard it anyway. It burst in the air between them, spittle flying onto them both. He tried to see some sea view, but the foursome across the aisle had pretty much blocked the window with their heralds. Only a few bits of railside overgrowth bounded past above their heads, no chance of Sue being decorative, he thought, eyeing the chins on one of the Mrs. Heralds, the big reading specks, the bad bright lipstick, the big scallopy perm. 
Sue had been on the way to podging up like that, but then it was partly his fault, all these jokes about big arses. She'd taken herself in hand, and not in any fun, sexy way. She'd ground off the weight, living on fricking salad, stopped joining him in the booze every night, exercised like a maniac, and now she was the scrag she'd always wanted to be. She had. She'd actually said as much. Much rather be a scrawny old chook than a blob, she said. And she'd topped it off with that Auschwitz haircut, so that absolutely nothing took your eye away from her haggard face. Crikey, that's short, he'd said when he first saw it. Is that so you can get the knit comb through? Joking was all he could think of to do. I know, she'd said, busily putting the shopping away. I look like a bull dyke, but better a bull dyke than a frump. I didn't think you looked like a frump, he'd said cautiously, although that would have been exactly the word to express his dismay, the dismay he felt now as he eyed this specimen in the carriage. You didn't think anything, bag Russell, covered bang. You haven't looked at me with the light on for about ten years. The Sheilas shifted and Don steeled himself. But then they settled again and he went back to staring at the white-faced Sheila opposite him. Her chest, pressed out either side of her knees, was wrapped in such a mess of black bits it was hard to know what was boob and what was curves of cloth. Still, there looked to be a fair bit of substance there. He uncrossed his legs and crossed them the other way. Cape still, said Sue, wriggling around like a bloody rabbit. He missed Sue's boobs. It seemed like a horrible joke on him that she felt good enough about herself now to get on top of him, just as she lost the whole reason he wanted her up there. The light might be off, but sometimes the morning light showed him the undersides of what was left of her breasts, like sad little bags of cottage cheese, all the plumping fluid diet and exercised out of them. They jiggled and re-wrinkled when they should have swung generously towards his mouth and away and her face above was clenched closed as his own was when he wasn't sneaking looks. Did she sneak looks at him and think the same things? God, it was Crumple City up there, the skin slipping forward at the sides of her eyes, her lips gone to fissures. She wasn't whiskery, at least. No, she'd waxed her upper lip and a couple of places on her chin to down-free leather but her tongue was scalded rough as a cat's with years of the too hot tea she liked. And he didn't like to think about it, but there was this slight smell about her lately. The Sheila straightened her back and stretched her legs wide. Here we go, he said, not to Sue. All the bajazzle on display. Sequins crowded around the girl's black tights gusset, tiny, shiny animals fighting for a place at the eye-shaped pool that was the sequin-free patch right in her crotch. They scattered out more loosely down her inner thighs, flocked up over her pubes towards the shelter of her rucked-up black skirt, roamed away along the betighted cleft of her bum. That was pretty restrained, really. That time on the train after the New Year's fireworks, one girl had paved that eye shape with pinhead-sized red lights. They'd flashed in circles, middle to rim to middle, over and over like a snake trying to hypnotize you. A lot of them did this shiny green thing, embroidered or other cloth sewn on, a leafy face with the fanny as the mouth and leafy arms or wings out along their thighs. Or they drew hands on, the straight fingers holding the fanny wide open with all kinds of fancy stitching around, patterns, unreadable, ancient writing. Now that her knees were out of the way, the Sheila's bosom had fallen forward more comfortably, and now it filled with the breath she took. Noise began from her and from all of them, suddenly and softly like a foghorn, on several notes that didn't belong together. The girl he could see, 
she hummed out through her nose, this other one facing away from him, the curve of her cheek with the black and white teeth painted on it, flattened as she opened her mouth and let the sound out of her throat, out of the depths of her. The singing was always louder than he expected, and deeper than it should be from girls, deeper and creepier. Even though he'd been ready for it, still it sent a shock up the back of his head, and he suppressed a shiver. The two Sheilas let go their knees and dropped their hands to grasp their underthighs, the black eye pool widening among the sequins as the girl's fingertips, black under the nails, pulled her thighs wider apart. In the moment her gaze flicked across him, he felt how his lip had curled. He dropped his head forward, then looked up sideways at Sue. God, he said through his teeth. How do they do that? Make the whole carriage shake. The windows would have rattled if they hadn't been sealed in place. These girls knew the exact wrong notes to put together. Sue lifted her face from the kindle. She was one of those women now who go about in public with a smile half prepared on their face. So if they see a baby or a dog or they catch someone's eye, they can boost it up into a twinkle. She turned this ready expression to the girl with the painted-on teeth. She'd have a better view of that one than he had. She'd be able to tell if her chest was as good as the other ones. Not that she'd look at that, of course. He didn't like how the expression settled on Sue's face, as if she warmed to what she was seeing, as if she was in cahoots with them. Yes, pleased that they were clamoring into everyone's heads and vibrating there. One of the voices was so deep, he felt it through his seat. Had they smuggled a bloke in there with them? Was some bloke in the carriage joining in? Across the aisle, a newspaper crumpled, and a petty little voice said, Yoo-hoo! People trying to read here! The other woman in the foursome muttered something, too. Racket was the only word he was sure he'd heard right. It was good to know someone else didn't feel as holy and patient as Sue about the sacred fricking rites of the Sheilas. At the same time, how thin the women's voices sounded against the girls' song. Their little peeps had no chance against this blast, this flooding, this noise of old, old grudges and pain. Sue had read it all out to him from the Sheila's wiki page once. He'd half listened. It's really interesting, she'd said, which had put him off. Bunch of bloody whingers. He hadn't been game to say it, but he'd thought it. Miserable cows. They should just get over it, get lives. His face was sore from holding the wince. The pitch changed and he drew up his shoulders more. A shudder took him by surprise. He hoped the bosom girl hadn't seen out the corner of her eye. She'd be gratified by that, tell her friends about it afterwards, when they went for their cappuccinos and mochas and bloody frappes at the cucina in Thirl, to congratulate themselves on giving everyone nightmares. He clung to the thought of them there, ordinary again, foolish and young in their costumes and paint. He clung because the noise of them was ancient, horrible, more than he could deal with. He wedged his hands under his own thighs because there was nothing for them to do but tremble or cover his face. Sue had been admiring the girl all this while. Was she hoping she'd look over her shoulder so Sue could smile at her? You go, girl. Give her the thumbs up. Now she twitched her mouth at Don the tiniest bit. It didn't take much with her near-bald head and brown lips for her to be laughing at him. Laughing with them at him. Relax, she said, as if to a panicking child. It'll be over soon. Going right through my head. His voice sounded as flimsy as the Herald women's across the way. He could hardly hear it for the swelling and falling battle of the hums and the shouting in his own head for them to stop. It's meant to, she said. Oh, good then, he squawked. Great. She shrugged, waited for a song wave to ebb. 
It's a free country. And this is public transport. They're not begging and they're not murdering anyone. I don't see your problem. She might have organized this herself. So neatly were these girls punishing him for the road rage incident. Either I drive, she'd said, knowing he wouldn't be able to stand that, or you can drive down on your own, or you can come with me on the train. She was glad they were crammed in here with the paper-flapping oldies and the mad Sheilas. She could sit here with her tidy Kindle and her tidy body and her tidied away to almost nothing hair and look out at everyone else's suffering and wonder why they hadn't sorted themselves out the way she had. Really, why would you live any other way? Nice waist you've got there, he'd said one morning, hoping she'd stop dressing and come and have sex and because he couldn't bring himself to compliment her muscly bum with its underfrills of cellulite. She'd turned to smile at him over her shoulder. One of her withered breastlets had poked out into view under her arm as she pulled up her full brief undies. It had been a nice smile, maybe a bit tired, maybe a bit I've got the measure of you, maybe a bit yes, well, I worked bloody hard enough for this waste. It had depressed him deeply. Kappa, she'd said. One by one, the Sheila's voices eased off. There must be two of the deep-voiced ones. No one person could hold that note so long without a break. Then it ceased. Thank goodness, said one of the Mrs. Heralds, not quite under her breath. The other woman peered at Don, her eyes swimming in her glasses frames, and the two blokes gave him blank, Wary looks. I've heard this three or four times now, he said across the aisle, trying for jocularity. Nobody ever claps. One bloke looked at the Sheilas again, still blank-faced. The other tried for some kind of matey tilt of the head. Sue's voice came faintly from behind Don. Maybe that's cause it's not put on for your entertainment. Biting back a little flare of rage at her shaming him so casually in front of these people, he sat back, looking straight ahead, back down the tracks to Sydney. His whole fucking weekend, that he would have liked to spend getting the yard in order and watching the MotoGP on Saturday night, had been taken over by this party of duffs, by this obligation. And now his wife, who was supposed to be his support, his helpmate, was holding him up for these podges to laugh at, because a bunch of black-dressed cunts had come and poured out their great complaint into everyone's journey. He wouldn't ask her what it was for, then. Either she'd explain it calmly and with the university words that irritated him so madly, or she'd tell him to look it up himself the way she had. It wasn't her job to teach him feminism for beginners. He stared at the seatbacks and the black dreadlocks on the squatting girl beyond it. The silence was easing out of the carriage, though the chat was still a bit tentative, a bit frightened from what they'd done. I'm going to the men's, he said, and got up and left. Don's good at a party, better than Sue. He goes from group to group, filling glasses. You could mingle for Australia says Sue, anchored to the beach with a bunch of women he knows she doesn't like. He fills her glass, kisses her ear just to hear the women say, Aww, floats on by. He was born to circulate this way, two-fifths full himself, greeting, offering, accepting thanks. The afternoon turns blue and the stars start hardly noticeable. Then he gets enmeshed in a conversation with Terry and Denise, and the next time he looks up, the black sky is thick, thick with them. The Milky Way, properly milky, this far from town. The ship that is the party sails on. The fireworks come and go, the oohs and ahs at those, and after the last explosion he's marooned for a moment, smiling by the fire, at the edge of a resumed conversation about Zumba classes. He waits for a chance to step in with his joke about things going off with a bang for the birthday boy. She comes up to him then. Her name's Belle. She gives it to him, spells it for him straight off. 
Is that a bit aggressive, or should he like her for her straightforwardness? She's one of the very few singles here. She's pretending to be cool about it, but he can almost smell that she's feeling it. Tightly bound, she is, into a dress made of some stretchy cloth, big, dark, bright flowers splashed onto a white background. She's got a waist, too, though not Sue's sort. This one's a statement, held in with a big, broad belt. Everything springs out above and below it, cunningly smoothed and sculpted by some magical undergarment. Her breasts push towards him at her neckline like a bum crack offered on a silver tray. He feels kind and honorable, watching her eyes and animation as she talks, never letting his gaze stray down there or his finger itch to run its tip along the crack or his palms hunger to grasp the whole slippery elasticized size of her bosom, the bolster of her bottom. She'd be the same age as Sue, but full-faced she looks younger. Her thick hair curls to her shoulders, dark with red glints, he thinks, that might be firelight. It might not even be dyed. She's painted her face, but not so much that he's repelled, She's refreshed her lips since the buffet, and the glisten along the edge of them, well, it does what it's supposed to do. He's flattered that she's taken so much trouble, and that she laughs so willingly at everything he says. She does that thing women sometimes do when they first meet him, of asking more and more personal questions as if they've got a perfect right to know, then laughing when he hedges and squirms. She smells great despite his dislike of most perfumes, or perhaps it's that the wafts take turns with gusts of bitter campfire smoke and the smell of several thousand bucks worth of spent fireworks. He takes a break from Belle's headiness. Look at Sue over there, rocking, holding her elbows, her bored smile. She's wishing she was tucked up in bed with Mr. Kendall, as she usually is this time of night. Which house are you in? Belle asks him. Duff and Kath have rented out half this tiny beachside town to put their guests in. The big un. Oh. She all but curtsies, pushing out her plummy lips. You're one of the inner circle, are you? Absolutely. I've put up with the old bugger long enough. Known him since tech. Gotta be some sort of prize for that, don't you reckon? Ooh, someone's jealous. She returns his surprised look coolly. Come on now, he's my mate, he says, just before the truth of her words hits him. How twisted out of shape his friendship with Duff has become since Duff's success and the beach house and the happy second marriage to Kath. And he hears in retrospect the tightness of envy in his voice. Across the way, Duff is mid-story with the smokers, all their eyes alight and blind-looking with firelight. What about you? Don almost snaps. Me? She says. Oh, which house you mean? Just here up on Shelley Street, the corner one. She points a dark, lacquered fingernail up at the black, motionless tangle of the bush behind them. Big green number? Little yellow one. Oceanside, she adds witheringly. Just in case you couldn't see or hear or smell this. She flings out an arm at the view. Rather than burying his face in her moonlit, firelit, spandex-wrapped bosom, he obligingly takes in the sea view. It sits in rows like a theater audience, its jewelry and spectacles winking under the moon the stars crowding in the balcony overhead. Haven't seen that house, he says. Went round all the others, borrowing chairs earlier. Got a sticky beak everywhere. It was great. All these years of coming down to Duff and Keth's, I've always wondered about the insides of these houses. Pop up and have a look now. She nods towards the path. Here, take the key. She unhooks it from her bangle. No, no. 
Against unfocused breast curve, the keys shoot firelight, a sad, worn lockwood and a mortise key that must be for a back door or a laundry, swinging with a pink, bulbous, transparent, plastic-sized ornament, maybe a fishing float, to make them unlosable. He holds back a joke about how much like a dildo that key ring is. I'll check it out tomorrow. We'll be gone tomorrow. We're all leaving at the crack of dawn to get back for choir and things. Everyone's got Sunday rituals. He's not quite sure what's going on, what the dynamic is, what it should be. Her eyes don't give anything away. Yet this is some kind of challenge, right? All right, I will. He takes the key, careful not to touch her plump hand with its glossy nails. They both smile, and she nods rapidly, her eyes even brighter with that skillfully smudged dark makeup around them. Back in a tick, then. Carefully, he tramps up the drier sand, the whiskery grass. Steps and a railing lead him onto the path up the slope among the tall, slender, dreamy-headed trees. It's quiet, all the usual noisy birds asleep roosting around him, disguised among the foliage like some kind of puzzle. At each turn, when he glances back, the fire's smaller, taking up less of the night. Bell still stands at the edge, gazing into the flames. The party's a murmur, and the wavelets fold themselves softly away along the sand. He should have asked her to come, too. Show me, he could have said, easily. What was he frightened of? At the top, he crosses the car park, a clearing carpeted with flattened gum leaves. Not the big green house, he says as it looms into view. The little yellow one. The little yellow... Surely not. It's across from the green one, right in the fringe of the bush. The dingy-looking one. He knows it well now that he sees it. Whenever they've walked past it before, Duff or Sue has shuddered and said, All it needs is police tape, that one. Fibra box, mean-looking windows, concrete porch with a sketchy 60s metal railing, rue-bitten grass all around. The garage is scared off into the back corner of the block, too little for anything more than a Morris Minor. A flat-tired trailer is chained up to the hill's hoist. But. Oceanside it is, says the beaten copper plaque on the front. The outer screen door is as light as cardboard. He fits and turns the key, pushes the door open across the fat nylon carpet. He stamps the sand of his shoes onto the frayed doormat before stepping in. It smells exactly as he expected it would, of mildew, with low notes of tomcat and dirt, he stands, heart fluttering in the darkness, then reaches to the light switch. A fluorescent strip flickers, ticks, then lights up the lounge room cruelly and with an ongoing buzz. A black vinyl couch slumps opposite. Two chairs of once green fabric on pivot bases wait about. Horrid, nested tables lurk hard against the walls, on top of a low bookshelf, a John Grisham and a Stephen King lean, and on the bottom shelf, cables and old game consoles have fought to a deadlock. There's a Laminex bar, one stool beside it with a split red vinyl seat. Perhaps as a kind of joke, someone's collected tiki's large and small hung them askew on the stained walls, stood them in every corner, dark with age, frosted with dust, they stare past him, past each other, blind or pearly-eyed. Jesus. Stiff-legged with horror, Don crosses to the kitchen. The spongy carpet gives way to sticky lino. The cupboards crowd out of the walls, each with a little plastic vent of an eye. The sink is coated with scum. Did Duff and Kath not check this place out before they rented it? The countertop stove looks as if it's only ever cooked up drugs. The fridge clunks and shudders in the corner like an ancient, startled dog.
he ventures across the curling lino of the hall to a tiny bedroom all leaning towers of boxes. One of the closer ones has split down one seam and sprayed National Geographics all the way to the door. The bathroom? Less said, the better. It's like something out of a 60s mental home. Icy gray-blue bath and blue, blue and white mottled tiles on the floor. This floral sings a different note from the lounge rooms. With dread, he creeps up to the master bedroom, pushes open the door, strokes the wall inside for the light switch. God, what is that? Twenty watts? The lampshade is curvaceous, crimson, fringed, some of the fringing parting from its braid. Somebody died here, says the chenille-covered bed with its dips either side of the center line, or perhaps two people lay here year after year despising each other. The pillows are so flat he could cry. But across the bed corner lies a summery dressing gown, dark pink and sumptuous. He can smell Belle's perfume. A pair of black mules with feather puffs on the toes lets out a little cheer on the carpet's gray. Clothes half pulled from their folds spill from a purple wheel aboard on the floor to his left. Something slithery and mauve white, something flower sprigged, a diaphanous thing that might be a sarong. He can't help but imagine Belle getting her outfit together for tonight, padding about in her underwear, bending, breathing the way Sue used to breathe before she got fit. He doesn't touch. To stop himself touching, he edges round the bed. In the mirrored nook of the wardrobe, Belle's makeup bag bulges, new, soft, agape, its zipper twinkling, a gleaming badge on its side. The things she's taken out lie like jewels around it, artifacts, gold and ebony, little cases of color and brush, buds of foam that have stroked smoky glitter into the creases of her eyelids. His mouth waters. He picks up the nail polish bottle. Inside is black, with only, as he holds it up to the poor light, the deepest ghost of red. He squints at the label, letter by tiny letter. Midnight in Moscow, it whispers. Three footfalls on the porch, two in the hall. Sprung. He slips the bottle back in the bag, turns to the door just as she arrives. Ha! Huh. She leans against the door jamb. Her top half is darkened red by the light shade. Of her face, he can't make out more than the glitter of her eyes. Her skirt is clearer, her white, curved legs, her neat, tucked ankles, her plump, sandy feet, the nails painted midnight in Moscow. He wants to fall on them, brush the sand off, lick away the salt. I thought of you up here in this room. Her voice is muffled, as if from a worn-out vinyl record. I got so turned on. Jesus, he says. Jesus, this is a horrible place. What were Duff and Keith thinking putting you here? A woman like you. He takes a step towards the door. So hot. He hears her cloth-covered hip make a little tremble against the doorpost. She takes the neck of her dress and pulls the stretchy cloth off her shoulders, off an amazing brassiere that, even in this poor light, goes to his head and to his dick. Its cups curve, full. The bold pattern of its lace squiggles on his brain. Not flowers, fronds, maybe. With thorns? He progresses to the corner of the bed, some dumb idea in his head of stopping her, but no command yet issuing from his mouth. From the dress sleeves she draws arms so white, he startles himself with a longing to bite and mark them. She takes hold of the middle of the bra, unclicks it, and spreads it wide. Her breasts release outward almost with an audible cry, that he almost cries back to. They're glorious, pale, lighting up the dimness, 
Big, brown, shiny nipple rounds on them with little mouths in the middle pushing out from the masses that jiggle and pant in their new freedom. I'm a married man, he says in the smallest voice ever heard from a human throat. She lifts the breasts and pushes them at him, her face almost swooning above them, her mouth raised and open, perfume and heat coming off her into this mausoleum of a room. That makes it all the hotter. Oh. She drops them, reaches up, pulls him down and presses their lips together, thrusts into his mouth a tongue so juicy and soft that his eyes roll back in his head. He sinks forward, onto and around her. She gives just her fleshly self, yields, but then her knees give way, and in a swarming collapse he goes with her down to the bed. She is hot, and downy smooth, and soft, great soft armloads of her, the cushion of her back warm against his wrists, and the softer skin inside his forearms. Groaning, he squeezes up and down her, squeezes her arse, tight-packed in its smoothing elastic, presses her to his erection. Gasping back from the kiss, he dives down her, sucks a nipple deep enough into his throat to gag. She puts her head back and makes wonderful noises, high desperate yearning, and she shudders and grasps and flails with her hands so much she might already be coming. He surfaces, her face flings back and forth against the pink silk garment, her open lips like black sheeny pillows, breath shaking them in and out. Oh, look at you, he breathes. Muzzily, she meets his eye. The lampshade lights a crimson fleck deep in her wide black pupils. She lifts her legs, hooks her ankles together behind him, and pushes him hard against herself. Her underwear seems rub. He feels them very precisely through his trousers, hears the creak of her wet crotch against his tightened trouser cloth. Oh, man. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Hold on. I don't want to go off yet. He lets her fling him off, push him flat onto the bed, jump aboard his thighs, attack his pants. Now would be the time to stop her. But she arches her back above her fallen dress top, thrusts out her breasts. No, he must not look at them so white, so wonderful, not now that he knows the feeling of that giant nipple on and in his mouth, the warmest warm, the smoothest smooth. She gets him out of his trousers. Ah, she beams down on his fellow leaping there, stained looking in the crimson light. He could go off from just her watching him, her great breasts rising, falling, shaking with her speeding pulse. She hoists up her bottom and reverses off him, stands, lets the dress drop to the floor, unfastens the dim-colored underlayer and lets loose the rest of her full white self with a gust of perfume into the poisonous room. Trapping him in her smudged crimson gaze, she pushes her hands all over herself, kneads a breast, splays her other fingers through her black pubic hair, clutches there, closing her eyes, biting her lip, twitching her hips back and all the bottom flesh on them. Come on to me, he says raspingly, propping himself on his elbows. She gets astride him again, dark-faced, glowing-breasted under the swinging light, her wet self, all her hot, slippery, interleaved folds, rubs at his penis. He grasps after self-control. Her eyes might be open or closed in that shadow. Her whole face might be bruised, her mouth the worst bruise of all. She slides up, leans forward, brings her face down, shows her teeth. She presses the tip of him deep 
into herself and slides back slowly, taking the rest of him in, grinning and letting out a growl. She's hot in there, scalding hot, and wet and tight and many-folded. With a low roar, it's weird, but he likes it. The change in her excites him. He loves everything about her in this moment. In a few strokes, she brings him off, clenching onto him, keeping him pinned as he otherwise convulses. It eases, but his bowels are still half in spasm when she starts again, rocking and rubbing. She's tight, her muscles hard as rocks in there, and the nub of her that seeks satisfaction in the jammed, clammy hairs at the root of him is hard, too, a nub of stone, nearly painful, rubbing and rubbing. No, really painful now, and she's going to crush him inside there. She's fierce and fast and seems to have forgotten him. Frightened, he grabs for her to remind her and to reassure himself. But her breasts shrink in his hands, the skin wither and pinching like a dying balloon's. He lets go with a shout. His handprints show in the flesh. One of her nipples folds into itself, blurring as she rocks harder and faster than any woman should be able to. She's like some kind of manic monkey on him, the foolish mouth on her wider and wider smeared across her cheeks. All of her shrivels and the well-filled sheen of her skin dulls, darkens. She turns crepey then sags to outright wrinkles, hanging, flapping in places from the new angles of all her bones. Frazzles of graying hair thin and retreat across her spotted scalp. The noise in her throat as she works is dry now. Her tongue is white sandpaper between her teeth. Her eyes pop wide, staring at a point beside his face. She jags back and forth, digging at the base of what little is left of him. Her breasts are no more than slipped crumplings on her chest. Her kneecaps are pearly in the crimson light, the fronts patched rough and white. Her limbs are bone and sinew loosely covered with that paper skin. Her eyes roll she straightens out like a praying mantis. She slides cold fingers under his arse and claws him steady while she bears down on him, mashing his penis, it feels like, stabbing the base of it through with that pulsing nub stone. A coldness spreads back around his balls, across the shrinking flesh there, across his fear-clenched bumhole. She finishes that pass, gasps forward grayly, grinds down on him again, juddering like a truck on air brakes, beating, buckling, her breath loud in her teeth in their leather cave. The room's cheap surfaces, fibro, laminex, MDF, the thin glassed window in its aluminum frame throw back at him the abject sounds he makes. He covers his face to blub, but she wrenches his arms aside and laughs at him. Still grinding, still pulsing, she forces her kiss into his face, the breath stuttering in her gnarled nose, her narrow lips like bands, her tongue knocking like a bone end in his throat. And then she's done. She springs off him up by his head, even as she goes, he's slithering out from under, checking himself. There seems to be no blood. She's dug no cavity, no gouge marks in him. All's familiar there, bunched and dangling, bedraggled as far as he can see in this terrible light. Smacked against the far wall, he hauls up his pants. The woman squats, gloating on the pillow, propped against the wall. Only her fanny and feet show uncrimsoned by the lampshade. Only her teeth gleam and her eyes glitter from the shadowed part of her. His pants fastenings have never seemed so perplexing, his fingers so useless among them. Cover yourself up, woman. 
By contrast with the black window, with the red gloom all around, the only thing bright lit is her grinning, wet undermouth. Her hands are dirt dark and greasy looking. Her skinny thighs dirt wiped too. The lips between that she holds wide proudly are fat as a grouper's, goose fleshed, purplish, sparsely haired, white and black. Between them, other lips, unspeaking and unspeakable, part and show others that open on others again, in and in like the circles of a cyclone's eye, and shifting upon themselves in just that way. Don tips towards the sight of them, catches himself, fights to the door. He falls out into the lounge room. When did she kill the light? But the song picks him up from his stagger, taking him by the head like a claw. The noise he thought was his own alarm is a real sound outside him, a room full of humming, all disharmony. What he thought were tiki's hung from the walls, crouching on their perches in the gloom, have taken on flesh. He can smell it, unwashed, intimate. He can hear limbs shifting under the sound of the voices, their foul earth breath ghosts over him in the stirred air. They begin to turn and shine their eyes towards him, tiny white discs bobbing in the gray. Still clutching his pants closed, he dives for the open front door. He wangs up against the railing, bounds from the steps, flees across the lawn. At the lookout above the beach, he backs up to the wooden fence and tidies himself. His eyes on the house as if to keep anything from following. The trees tower over him, hissing slightly in their sleep. He's caught his breath. He thinks he's ready. He turns towards the stairs. The party's down there just as he left it, milling in amber firelight. At the edge of it, a buxom woman, her white dress splashed with flowers, cradles a glass of wine. Pushing her dark hair back over one ear, she casts him a long look up through the trees. And then is gone, as if she never stood there on the party-muddled sand that slopes away to the sea. Note. Sheila Nagigs are stone carvings, many quite crudely made, found on various medieval structures, often religious buildings, in Britain and Europe. They depict women of different ages and degrees of ugliness, with their legs spread to show their genitals. Often the woman's hands are carved to touch or hold open the vulva. No explanation for these figures or their location has survived from the Middle Ages, but it is speculated that they had significance as guardians or fertility symbols, or to avert evil or bad luck. The Pike by Conrad Williams Carpers further down the canal were using fish meal and pellets to try to tempt the doubles, but Lostock wasn't interested in them. Carp might fight for longer, but they weren't as aggressive as Pike. He didn't like the look of them, those bloated and gormless mouth breathers. They turned his stomach. He'd talked to bailiffs and other fishermen about the water. Some were happy to chat with him, others hunched over their gear like poker players protecting a good hand as he approached. They'd tell him what he already knew. They suggested he find another place to fish, that this place was dead now after long years of pressure of inexperienced anglers fouling the stock. Nothing much left. I only fish here because it's close to home, and I can't get around as much as I used to. In their eyes... Piss off. This is my swim. Sling your bleeding hook. Or rather, don't. It was a deep canal, five feet in the main, sinking to six in some places. The margins were shallower, and this was where most of the snags were to be found. Weed beds, shopping trolleys, knotted drifts of ancient polythene. 
Over the years, Lowstock had lost any number of rigs to rusted, sunken bicycles or reefs of fly-tipped refuse. It wasn't ethical to lose a baited treble hook in the water, no matter that they were barbless these days. So now he tested extensively the stretches he fancied, clearing the water of obstacles or making sure of the depth so he could cast accurately above the bed. He noticed that in some areas near the bank the depth was similar to that in the middle. Pike were known to lie up against the bank or within holes. They'd be attracted to this extra foot or so of water. He knew he might be onto something when he found one such spot near a factory. Outflow pipes flooded the canal with warm water, fish bliss. He'd often been told by his granddad that if you ever found an area like this, you should give it some time. Tend it like a garden, you'll reap rewards. So he'd bought a clean, empty paint tin from B&Q and punctured it all over with a screwdriver. He'd begged the fishmonger for a bucket of his waist and filled the tin with chopped heads, fins, and guts. He'd added oil from a carton of mackerel fillets and left it by the heater in his shed all afternoon. He took the stinking tin to the canal in the evening and tied a rope to the plastic handle. It had hurt to do so, but he managed to sling it out to the swim he had his eye on. That bit of the water that roiled and rolled with the warm current from the outflow. He pegged the rope down and beat it into the packed soil of the bank and went home, checking first that nobody had seen him at work. He ate. He bathed. He coated his skin in imiquamod cream. He slept. There never seemed to be any great stretch between closing his eyes and opening them again. He couldn't remember his dreams anymore. It was his skin rather than the alarm clock that brought him back. Skin so tight and dry it must belong to another body. It itched constantly, no matter how much of the cream he applied or how often. The doctor wanted him to go for surgery, but Lowstock had a thing about scars. Scars changed the way you looked. He became someone else, and he was only just coming to terms with the person that he had been shaped into. But then, maybe, it would be for the best if he did change. To be physically altered, to be at some part removed from the caste of his ancestors. The slightly prominent forehead, the downward slope of the mouth. It would help him to forget that he was the sum of a number of parts that were at best defective. Why don't you get itched, Jimmy? Why ain't you settle down? He turned away from the voice. He became absorbed by the routine, the flask of tea, the sandwiches, one beef paste, one ham and cheese, wrapped in greaseproof paper and tucked into the lunchbox with an apple, a ski yogurt and half a packet of malted milk, his little radio permanently tuned to talk sport. He never listened to a word, but he needed the mutter and grumble to help distract him from more persistent voices. A check on the tackle he'd loaded, a fold-away chair, the bait. He put the car into neutral and let the handbrake off. He coasted down the rise to the main road and only switched on the engine when he was twenty feet clear of the last house. Five a.m. and a white skin on the world. Everything shivering the trees, the engine, the fine net of frost hanging in the air. He drove past a bungalow with the red Fiat 127 in the drive, and he almost cried out. His first car had been a 127, a hand-me-down from his dad who was half-blinded by glaucoma and unable to drive. He remembered many journeys prior to that, sitting in the back seat, no radio, no seat belts in the back, wind-up windows, the most basic model. His mother, Oh, it's got a ruddy engine then. An episode leaped to the head of the queue. The one time Dad took him and his granddad fishing. Granddad hauling in breath to a pair of lungs turned to worn leather after a lifetime of heavy smoking. He'd listened to his dad moaning about the prime minister, about his lack of a pay raise, about the quality or lack of it of the beer at the Imperial. 
He didn't understand a word of it. He just watched his granddad's hawkish profile, his wet blue eyes, the dry, sucking slit of his mouth. Later, when the deck chairs had been set up, his granddad sat and watched his rod. He didn't speak. He never spoke, not to Lowstock, anyway. He always wore a faraway look, as if he was remembering his youth, before asbestos, before smoking, or pneumonia took it away for good. He'd never been hugged by the man, though he'd opened his arms to him when it was time to say goodbye. His grandma hugged him plenty, enough for both of them, he supposed. What remained of his white hair curled out from beneath his cap like the barbs of a feather. Dad showed him how to thread the line through the eye of the rod and attach a float. The lead shot, the hook. They brought bait in labeled Tupperware tubs, breadcrumb, sweet corn, and maggot. His dad told him there was a trick to making a maggot wake up quickly after a night in the fridge. Pop one in your mouth for a few secs, warm him up, then hook him on. But Lowstock wouldn't do it. His mom had told him that a boy had done exactly that on a fishing trip, and something in or on the maggots had infected him, burned his tongue and lips and his penis from the inside out. He was all blisters now, and he would never have kids of his own. You talking nonsense, Barb. Don't fill the lad's head with shite like that. I ruddy amant. You let him put maggots in his mouth and I'll play holy hell, Bill Lowstock. See if I ruddy don't. His dad showed him how to keep a finger on the line while you were casting, right up until the last second. Granddad's float was orange, Dad's was yellow, and his own was luminous green. He stared at it for hours. He stared for so long that the float became superimposed on his eyelids whenever he closed them. Water wolf, slow shark, old Jack. Jack'll take your fingers, his granddad told him, while his dad went off to take a piss. If you don't show him some respect, almost killed my father. The mirror lay before them like a trembling brown skin. Lowstock was shocked into silence by the suddenness of Grandad's utterance and the way his voice sounded. It was really quite lovely, rich and liquid and touched by inflections that didn't sound like anybody he knew in his hometown. Grandad had been on a boat as a child with his father, Tom, fishing for pike when the pike rammed them. His father and he both fell into the water. Grandad almost drowned. The pike rammed Tom in the face, scarfing down an eye. Grandad managed to pull himself back into the boat and splashed at the water with the paddle until he was sure the fish was gone. He didn't know who was screaming the most, him or Tom. Other fishermen on the bank had been roused by the commotion and waded out to them. Is that the worst thing you ever saw? Lowstock asked him, and his voice had been tiny in the oppressive room under the cracked Lancashire slur of his granddad, leaning over him with his hawkish face, the grim, shark-bow mouth. It were the worst I ever felt, watching me dad go into the water and see that monster try to drill itself into his head. He leaned closer. Lowstock smelled tobacco and Uncle Joe's. We all of us have a chapter like that. A black chapter. Sometimes you write it yourself. Sometimes some bastard writes it for you. His dad came back then, face red from the sun. They stayed until dusk and packed up, empty-handed, his dad cursing the water and the idiots that were supposed to stock it. Kev Bedal had told him there were scores of perch in the mirror, Big ones, too, five pounders. He reckoned there might be a British record in that water. Kev Badal's got shite for brains, he remembered his dad saying. His granddad resembled a fish discarded on the bank, sucking uselessly at the air, waiting for the priest to batter the life from him. He had wondered if maybe his granddad was a pike in disguise and might be better off in the water. Lowstock had stared at his dad in horror, 
wondering if he had read his own black chapter yet. They stopped off at the pub on the way home, but he couldn't swallow his coke for the fear that swelled in his throat. Lostock reached the swim, his head thick and itchy with unpleasant memories that had not encroached for many years. His granddad had died maybe two or three years after that fishing trip, the only one they'd shared, and he could barely remember a conversation between them. It was as if Lostock did not exist when they were in the room together. His granddad stared straight ahead, at the wrestling on TV if it was on, or if not, at a space above it. Lived longer than I will, though, Lostock thought now as he set up his rig, fixing a wire leader to the line to foil the pike's teeth, attaching a circle hook, digging through the tubs of deads for some suitably tasty lure. He cast nervous glances east to the factory and what lay beyond. His skin trembled, as if in recognition. The sun was a bare, thin line skimming the houses in an area that had once been known as Arpley Meadows, where Thames Board Paper Mill had stood. He used to cycle up Sletcher's Lane to watch the cricket matches there in the summer and root about in the grounds because sometimes you could find spare rolls of gaffer tape as large as a tire. He might take some bin liners with him and fill them with the shreds and offcuts from the factory, caught in the guttering and ditches like wizard's hair. He went round the lanes near his house, selling it as bedding for rabbits and guinea pigs, a bit of pin money to keep himself stocked up on hooks and fresh line. He'd kept that green float for luck, and he used it now. He cast into the swirl of warm water by the outflow pipe and settled into his chair. He put on his sunglasses and cricket hat. He angled his umbrella against the coming dawn. He waited. Basal cell carcinoma. This skin cancer was, the doctor had related to him, a result of solar damage. As if he was no different to some kind of satellite. Plaques and lesions had formed and grown on his legs and arms, the skin becoming sore and red and even in some places scaly and crusted. The doctor wanted Lostock to go for surgery, had impressed upon him that this form of cancer was eminently survivable, but he didn't want any knife near him, which left him with dawn and dusk to hide his face, and a scarf when these inhabited acres became dotted with loners like him. Why didn't you get itched, Jimmy? Why didn't you settle down? He closed his eyes to his dead mother's voice, as if that might provide her with an answer that would satisfy her. She had, probably rightly, blamed his obsession with the fish for his inability to land what she called a proper catch, a keeper. His objections were down to his skin, but it wouldn't wash with ma'am, who had always made it sound as though he was to blame for his condition. No low stock ever had the skin cancer before, and we sunned ourselves daft, got sunburned and everything. All I can say is you ain't made of the same gristle as the rest of us, you daft git. He hadn't had the heart to mention all the holidays they'd taken to Reel and Bristaten and Aperest with when he was a child. Every summer in a caravan, two weeks of traffic jams, his dad pissed every night, and a diet of burgers, chips, and ice cream. Dawn till dusk out in the high seventies without sunblock, sucking down warm, sugary lemonade, always thirsty because of it. And when he woke up in the middle of the night in agony, his skin the color of boiled lobsters, blisters the size of footballs on his legs. His mother had sterilized a needle with the flame from a cigarette lighter and lanced them then squealed at him to sleep on the sofa when the lymph from within drizzled onto his sheets. That had happened so many times he couldn't count them. His GP had gone spare when he saw the scars. He ordered his mother to either keep him out of the noonday sun or slather him in Factor 50. What's that pale knob-end know about suntans and doctoring? His mother had wanted to know. And got no ruddy clue, and how dare he shout at me like that? The jumped-up snot-nosed bastard. What is he, twelve years old, and thinks he's God's gift to Elin? Thanks, ma'am. 
thanks for everything. His first memory of his ma'am reaching out to her from the pram, her oval face framed with prematurely gray hair, her brown eyes wrinkling under a brown smile, the filter between her brown fingertips. She used to dip his dummy in rum laced with honey to get him off to sleep. She forced it in his mouth like a plug that was slightly too small for the sinkhole. One time she caught a ragged fingernail on his lips and he cried so hard his throat hurt and the breath snagged in his chest. The green float disappeared beneath the surface of the water. He stared at it a moment, thinking of the fake emeralds around his mother's throat as they dipped below the scalloped neckline of her dress. He wondered where she had bought that, or who had given it to her. Behind every trinket, a story. She would... Christ! Any other fish, and he'd have lost it. But it was okay, with Pike, to take your time. Most of them attacked fish across ways, content to wait until they arrived back at their lair to turn their meal around and eat it head first. Hi, Jack, he said, without realizing. He struck into the fish and the immediate resistance of it corded his forearms. It was a big bastard, maybe twenty-plus pounds. The far bank, the factory, the wedges of leaden cloud rising on the horizon— all of this receded until his focus took in only the tip of his rod and the boiling surface of the canal just beyond it. It was in such moments, when the world mostly went away and he was blindly connected to the animal on his hook, that he felt anything like alive. His mind stopped harking back to a time when he wished he might have been happier. It did not pick at the scab of his grandfather or mope over the decay that drove his parents apart. His skin was just a dull sack that contained him, rather than a complex structure that was degrading, conspiring to pull him apart. There was a single, pure thought. How to deliver something from one element into another. The fish fought for a long time, longer than he was expecting. He wondered if maybe after all he'd struck into a carp, but then the fish rose and its duck-billed head became visible. An eye swiveled towards him from just under the surface, with its fixed black pupil like a hammered tack. He was granted a view of its pale belly as the fish rolled away from him all bronze, gold, rust. It was endless, ageless. The fish sank, and Lostock felt the tremor of its body as it flexed, thinning for depth. The line had broken. Now Lostock felt a pang of guilt through the brief depression of his loss. Fish hooked deep enough might starve to death because the hook and wire trace couldn't be removed without damage to the delicate gut. He put down his rod and cleaned his hands. The winter sun was finding a way through the mist, despite being unable to rise much higher than the factory roofs. Lostock got out of his chair and stretched his legs. Fighting the pike, and all that remembering had tired him, but it was still too early to turn to his lunchbox. He poured out another beaker of tea and took it downstream to the hump-backed bridge. The road was cracked, studded with potholes. On the other side of the bridge, it split into two. One branch curved left and cleaned up its act before it met the main roads on the outskirts of town. The other branch ended after a hundred yards at a steel fence locked into place with breeze blocks. The factory beyond was out of bounds, awaiting the wrecker's ball, presumably, or a slow decay into the foaming acres of autumn hawkbit and mind-your-own-business. There was a security poster fixed to the diamond links with nylon ties, but in all the hours Lostock spent on the canal bank, he had seen no sign of a patrol. No white vans, no dogs. He placed a foot against the fence, and it bowed inwards. Someone had been here before. Further along, where the fence became lost within a tangle of branches and brambles, it was torn and buckled. Lostock pushed his way through, careful not to snag his sore skin on any of the metal claws, and approached the factory entrance. 
The door had been recently secured with what looked like old railway sleepers bolted across the frame. The ground floor windows were boarded up with fresh panels. He took a mouthful of tea and spat it out. Cold. He'd been standing on the forecourt, staring up at the building for 15 minutes. Cramp laced the backs of his calves. He shook it out and walked around to the side. The hair on his back and shoulders was rising, but the temperature, if anything, had improved since dawn. Ducts and pipes, corroded by time and rust into metal wafers, sprawled from the factory wall like something gutted. He placed his hands against one of the less ruined conduits and felt warmth. He remembered the outflow pipe at the canal with its constant drizzle of warm water. What had they made here? Was the factory abandoned after all? He remembered this place from his childhood. You could see its sawtooth roof on the bus to and from school if you sat on the top deck. His granddad had worked here but he had no idea what he did. Dad told him he did carpentry in his spare time and had constructed the frames for the houses that backed onto the M6 through some of the villages dotted around South Cheshire. But this didn't look like any kind of timber factory. He saw now how, if he climbed onto the pipes that swarmed from the shattered housing, he'd be able to lever himself up a window that was only partially obscured by chipboard. The lure of the fish was only so great now that he was in the shadow of the factory. He felt the delicious tremor of criminality, unknown for years, since minor indiscretions as an underage drunk or shoplifting bars of chocolate from the corner shop. He placed his cup by the pipe and hoisted himself onto it, realizing too late that if the metal gave out under his weight he would injure himself badly. His skin was in no mood for cuts or abrasions. It held, but it made plenty of distressing creaks and groans. Flakes of rust and paint fell psoriatically away. As he drew closer to the window, there was a smell of chemicals and mildew, reminding him of the bathroom at his granddad's house, before he was moved to the home. He was fond of harsh-smelling products, vosine, Listerine, euthamol, TCP, Dettol. He would never have touched a jar of moisturizer. It was a wonder he had not dissolved in some of the things he slathered on his own skin. Lowstock pulled at the chipboard. It broke apart under his fingers. He pushed it away and gazed through the open window frame. The factory looked as though it had been abandoned in a hurry. There was a melamine table with the mint green surface covered in a film of grease and grime, peppered with plates and mugs. A padded jacket hung on a chair. Beyond that was a cavernous area swimming with moats. His fingers still sang with the tension from the fish, and he didn't feel the dull pebbles of glass that remained in the frame as he levered himself into the factory. His boots crunched on more of that glass and the dust and dead insects of God knew how many years. The air was cold and old. It smelled of feathers and spores. There was a rich mushroom odor underpinning the faint chemical ghost. Empty paint tins stood glued the floor by rust and their own leakages. In a corner, a pair of vermin-chewed boots stood facing the wall. Layers of paint and plaster peeled from the walls, revealing the lathe beneath, like rudimentary ribs in a creature that had been ignored by evolution. Much of December Woman had leached into the tiles above a bowl containing a boulder of solid sugar. Her face was smeared, her eyes accusatory. Leaflets explaining how to join a trade union were a gummed mass considering a leap from the corner of the worktop. Lowstock moved through the room, hating the gritty echoes that his feet threw up. He opened a door into a corridor flanked by offices. All of them were empty, the furniture flogged, the fittings and fixtures stolen or stripped out by renovators abruptly stymied by the plummeting economy. He found some evidence as to what the factory produced on the floor of what might have been the human resources base. 
There were yellowed dockets and invoices spilling from a file swollen with damp. They mentioned paper orders and quotas for recycled pulp. What he'd smelled all along was not the dank organic stench of mushrooms, but the ancient rot of paper. He meant to leave, then, sick of the smell, and the way the air was somehow coalescing around him, the tiny fibers of cellulose tickling his nostrils and blanketing his lungs. But something about the smell was growing more familiar to him the further along this corridor he progressed. Under the factory odors was something domestic, but not of these times. It was a mingling of notes that fled as soon as they arrived, like a word that would not sit still on the tip of the tongue. Naphthalene, suet, the hot cotton scent of antimacassar scorching by direct sunlight. Bleached hardbacks on a shelf, barely touched in fifty years. Brasso, Wright's coal tar soap, camp coffee. He was standing in an office without understanding how he'd reached it. Depressions in the floorboards showed where a desk and chairs had once stood. Gaps in the grill across the window allowed him to see his deck chair by the canal. What was he thinking? There was a couple of hundred pounds worth of gear lying there, waiting to be nicked. But he was rooted. Something in the air, this smell, this peculiar mixture of smells that he'd not known for thirty years. He stared at where the desk would have been and tried to imagine the shape of the head of the man sitting behind it. He found it hard to believe that people might have come to him to ask his advice for an aspect of work when he was so very recalcitrant in his private life. Lowstock imagined him at Christmas parties, or outings tie off the neck buttons undone, handing out pints, helping women into their coats. Thanks, Jack. Bye, Jack. There was a large plastic rubbish bin in the opposite corner. Somebody had made a half-hearted attempt at clearing out the room, but had either given in or stopped when it became clear the building was a hopeless case. He saw great clods of hoovered-up dust and carpet fibers, whiteboard markers, broken-in trays. There was a manila file in there, too, with Lowstock's initials on it. J.K.L. James Kenneth Lowstock. Inside were pictures drawn by a child, yellowed by time around the edges, pitted here and there by thumbtacks. Pictures of a man who had owned them, all gigantic faces and arms akimbo. Here was a picture of Grandad holding a fish in his fist. Lowstock did not remember drawing them, but there was his name at the bottom of each page, with the E and the S back to front. He wished his Grandad back for the first time, then. He thought he might be able to help him in the way the doctors and his parents had not. Why didn't you get itched, Jimmy? Why didn't you settle down? Is that the worst thing you ever saw? Lowstock was twelve when he went fishing for mirror carp with his best friend at the time, a boy from his class at school called Carl. They'd cycled to the gravel pit, mist-covered and gray this particular winter morning, with rods already set up and baited. Pieces of corn infused with vanilla extract speared on their hooks. Lowstock had told Carl vanilla extract was a bit gay, but Carl said the fish liked it, that they wouldn't spit the corn out because of it. They ditched their bikes next to the pit and pitched a tent. They made their casts and sat watching the tips of their rods. Soon Lowstock dug into his rucksack and started divvying up their breakfast. Morning rolls spread with peanut butter and mashed bananas, cold, crispy bacon wrapped in kitchen paper, a flask of hot chocolate. Lowstock was bored after a couple of hours. He wasn't the fishing nut. He'd agreed to come along with Carl, who had a passion for carp. It had sounded like an adventure. It was just cold and dull. He told his friend he was going to do a round of the pit on his bike, maybe see if there was anywhere to do some jumps. Carl waved him off. 
Something made Lostock turn to look back at his friend when he was on the opposite side of the pit. A figure, slight and pale, wearing a Lord Anthony covered in Star Trek badges and jeans so faded they were almost white. Almost immediately, he heard the sound of cows lowing. He turned toward the noise, nervous. He didn't like cows. He didn't like their thick pink tongues licking at two wet nostrils. He didn't like their swollen udders and the caking of shit around their tails. They stank. They attracted flies. He drove his mother berserk because she worried he wasn't getting enough calcium inside him. There were no cows in the field. He could hear the groan of morning traffic rising from the main road a couple of hundred meters away. And this lowing. He scrambled through the sludge of rotten leaves and mud, splashing cold, dirty water all up the back of his cords, and his mother was going to clear his lug holes out over that when he got home, and found his way barred by a fence. Behind that was a couple of parked cars and an open door. The sound was coming from that. He thought to go back to Carl and ask him about it, he knew his way around this place, but instead he dumped his bike and climbed over the fence. He went to the door and peeked inside. There were five men in white gowns and helmets, like a team of weird construction workers dressed up as ghosts. One of them turned around and Lostock was aghast to see an apron slicked with blood. He stepped back out into the cold air, glad of it in his chest, smacking him in the face. He thought about getting back on his bike and cycling to a phone booth, calling the police. There was murder going on here. He had to make sure. He ran around the back of the building, where lorries were backed up against open bays. He heard the cows again, and other noises, screams and squeals. This sounded nothing like the deaths that had occurred on Kojak. Through a window, he saw cows being led to pens. A man with what looked like a large black wand bent over them and pressed it to their heads. There was a hiss, a deep ka sound, and the animals dropped. He didn't know whether what he felt then was relief or sickness. It was just another kind of murder, after all. He was thinking of bacon sandwiches and whether he would miss them if he decided to become a vegetarian when he heard another scream. This one was altogether different. It was high-pitched, somehow wetter. It suggested a knowledge of what was happening to its author. He ran back to the windows, thinking of intelligent animals, wondering crazily when the British public had developed a taste for dolphins or octopi, and saw a long steel trench with lots of metal teeth turning within it. Someone had been piling indeterminate cuts and wobbling shiny bits of offal from a plastic chute into one end, but had got his arm trapped. His mates were running towards him, and the man was screaming, Shut it off! Shut it off! Thankfully, Lowstock couldn't see his face. He didn't say anything else after that, because the auger ground him into the trench and he was killed. He heard the scream cut out as if he'd flicked off his own power switch. He'd heard, even at this distance, through the glass, the pulverization of thick bone. He'd seen the teeth of the machine impacted with flesh and torn clothes. His face had risen from the trench, scooped up by a blade like a bad horror mask on a pound shop hook. Lostock was sick where he stood violent and without warning. It was as if someone had punched it out of him from within. He didn't remember climbing back over the fence, collecting his bike or returning to Carl. Where have you been, you bone-on? Carl demanded. You nearly missed this. He stood back to allow Lostock to look at the mirror carp lying in grass. It was enormous. It seemed deformed. Its skin was olive-colored. There were maybe four or five scales dotted near the tail and the dorsal fin. Its eyes protruded, its huge mouth gawped, gasping in the air. 
Lostock felt suddenly detached from nature. He couldn't understand how this thing could still be living, how it could have come into being in the first place. There was this sudden impact in his mind about the outrageousness of animals. He had sucked up science fiction films since the age of five and stared out at the night sky wondering if aliens truly existed without giving any thought whatsoever to the bizarre creatures that lived on his own planet. Elephants, rhinoceroses, squid, mirror carp. Here was as weird as you could get. He saw Carl for what he really was, a network of organs, blood vessels, bones, and nerves, a brain with ganglia, meat. The boy in the snorkel parka was gone forever. Everything had changed. I have to go home, he might have said. He didn't remember cycling back. He returned to the canal bank and loaded a hook with bait. The skin on the back of his hands was a mass of red striations. It felt loose on his face, like a latex mask he might be able to get his fingertips under and peel away. Despite the stink of the canal and the constant breath of the exhaust coming down from the main roads, he could smell the sweet riot of decay pulsing off him. He pushed it all away and concentrated on the green float as he cast the rig into the water. Almost immediately, he saw the pale underbelly of a pike as it rolled on the surface by the far bank. Something was wrong. Lowstock picked up his landing net and ensured his disgorger and his pliers were in his pocket, then hurried over the bridge to the other side. It was the same pike he'd caught that morning. He slid the net beneath it, careful not to startle it away. But this fish was going nowhere. There were ulcers all over its body, he could see now. Maybe where the fish had been fouled by careless anglers in the past, or something more serious. Struggling with the weight, Lowstock brought the fish ashore and got it onto its back. It must have been forty pounds. He placed his legs either side of the body. With his gloved hand, he grasped the pike's chin bone and tugged it upwards. The mouth yawned open, revealing a coral-colored throat. Nylon line reached into the shadows. Lowstock clamped the line between his pliers and wound it around the jaws. The gut rose into the mouth, revealing the embedded hook, a wash with blood. Christ, I'm sorry, Lostock said. With his other hand, he used the disgorger to remove the hook and pushed the gut back with the blunt end while holding the head as high as he could. His muscles burned and trembled under the weight of the fish. Its eye was fixed on Lostock the whole time. There was a cold, ancient wisdom there, and despite the circumstances and the poor condition of its flesh, Lowstock, as ever when he was in such close proximity to Pike, felt an immense swell of wonder. He heard his dad's voice. Softened by beer and a twelve-hour shift at the depot. They're mean-looking buggers, and they fight hard, but they have a glass jaw, them Pike. They die easy. He slipped into the water and drew the fish in alongside him. He tried to coax some movement from it, but it kept rolling onto its flanks. The majesty of it. The power. All potential was reduced in the end. Every spike of adrenaline was only a temporary thumbing of the flatline's nose. Because you have nothing else because you want to say goodbye. The cold crept through him, despite his exertions with the fish. His skin no longer troubled him. The pain was like something viewed through thick fog. This fish had been around for millions of years. He wondered if it was related to the one that had attacked his granddad as a child. He wondered if, in some freak of longevity, it was the same beast. 
and there was a jolt of alarm as he considered the fish might be faking its sickness and only wanted to trap him. But that passed, and he kept on with his ministrations. He got down low to the surface, close enough to smell the mud in its flesh, and he whispered to old Jack until night concealed everything. The Crying Child by Bruce McAllister it was the Cold War, and my father, who worked in anti-submarine warfare for the Navy, was stationed in Europe to help fight that war quietly, the way it was almost always fought. My friends from school in the little fishing village where we would live for three years weren't afraid, of course. It wasn't like a real war. There were no planes at night, no bombs, no radio announcements of impending invasions, and no wounded, bleeding men, nothing like the war their parents had fought in countless villages fifteen years earlier. And except for my own parents' occasional mention of nuclear missiles and the communist threat, I wasn't afraid either. Why would I be? I was thirteen. We all were thirteen, young, innocent, and trusting. We went about our business, which was the business of growing up. What could there possibly be to scare us? But there was one thing that frightened my friends, something that had nothing at all to do with war, and it was the cobblestone path that led from our village, little Lerici with its medieval church and castle, up through the olive groves to the hilltop where the villas of the old aristocratic families overlooked the Ligurian Sea. My friends, all born in La Ricci, were scared of that path and admitted it. It wasn't that you couldn't stay on the path and avoid the fork that took you to the even tinier village of Megusa halfway up the hill. It was that when the path did fork, you felt the strange pull of Megusa's olive groves and doorways with their red hammers and sickles, or what looked like hammers and sickles, and it felt like a spell, a trick of magic, one that left you feeling a little sick. That's how my friends put it, anyway, loving the drama of it. The grown-ups saw it differently. Megusa was a communist village, they said, if you could call something that small a village, and a communist village angrier than most. And that, the grown-ups declared, was all you needed to know. Lots of people in Italy were communists, church-going, card-carrying communists, who had no trouble believing both in God and the rights of the working man, of common people shortchanged by the aristocracy for far too long, but the residents of Megusa were different. They were communists so poor and so angry with the world that their comrades in other villages, no strangers to red bandanas and shouting crowds, didn't want to be around them. The residents of Megusa weren't even from Liguria, the grown-ups said. The original families, all olive pickers, had come from the farthest south, they looked like Southerners, too, short and darker, and that didn't help. Northerners had always looked down on Southerners, and always would. Or, as the grown-ups put it, the villagers of Magusa had never really adjusted to being Ligurians. But my friends knew better, they told me one day after school. Sure, the doorways of the village were short, which said Southerners, perhaps, and certainly said poor, the houses lined up side by side and touching on both sides of a cobblestone path no more than a few meters wide were narrow and dark and damp, and the doorways were shorter than most men. But this wasn't, my friends insisted, because the villagers of Magusa were small, though they were indeed squat and small. It was because the villagers wanted to keep something out of their houses, something bigger than men. And though, my friends insisted, the bright red slashes of paint on every door did indeed look a little like hammers and sickles, those infamous symbols of communism, they really weren't hammers and sickles at all. They were something else, something much stranger. Maybe the inhabitants of Magusa were communists, they said, and maybe they weren't. 
What mattered was not what the crude design in red paint on every doorway represented, they said, but what it did. Que dice? I said. After a year of tutoring and middle school, I spoke the language well enough. What do you mean, did? The doorways aren't enough. Gianluca, my best friend, the one with the long eyelashes who dreamed of working for Interpol when he grew up, said quietly, I was trying to get my friends to take the fork to Magusa that day because it was the shortest route by far to the Trattoria in Romito, the one that had the best ice cream on the coast, and I was in a mood for ice cream. We were bored as hell that afternoon, our geography and Roman history tests behind us, and ice cream was, in my case anyway, going to break the boredom. They'd argued with me, saying that the gelato at Trattoria Livia or Del Golfo on the waterfront was better, but I knew they just didn't want to walk all that way, especially if it meant going through Magusa. They've got the best pistachio, I'd said, and you know it. You're just scared. No. Blue-eyed Maurizio had said, turning red the way he always did when he lied. We just don't want to walk to Romito for your damn ice cream. No one uttered a word for a moment, and then Gianluca said what they were all feeling. We don't want you to go alone. Carlo, always the bravest and cockiest, snorted and said, Speak for yourself, Gianluca. I am, Carlo. Carlo snorted again, but didn't say anything else. Why not? I asked. I knew, but wanted them to say it. I didn't believe it, and I wanted to give them a hard time. You know why, Maurizio said shyly. All of this, everything you've told me before about Magusa, I began, you have gotten from adults who know? No, Maurizio said. You have imagined it, then? No. Gianluca frowned. We have put it together like detectives. We have lived here longer than you and we have had time to do detective work. Gianluca's boast embarrassed Carlo, who looked away, but still said nothing. Just the three of you. You three detectives? I teased. Of course not, Carlo said suddenly. The calculations began with my uncle, Paolo, who is twenty years older. He started with his friends to put two and two together when he was young, and my brother, Emiliano, who is ten years older, did the same. The detective work, if you want to call it that, has been accumulating for at least twenty years, Brad. And how do you boys know what adults do not? I asked, a part of me wanting to believe, but the rest not wanting to be a fool. Why did getting ice cream have to be so complicated? Gianluca took the condescending tone he sometimes had, the one you wanted to shoot him for, even if he was your best friend. You are so naive, Brad. You are an American and do not understand such things. Yes, Carlo agreed. You are like the adults who want to think what they want to think, to make sense of a world that doesn't always make sense. And so they do not really think. They do not use their brains. Carlo was a little older, had the highest grades in our subjects, and would be an attorney someday, we knew. Maybe even city attorney of La Spezia, the port to the north. They do not, he went on, really want to discover the truth. And so, Gianluca added, they do not explore. They do not bother to find out, to find out important things. This was getting ridiculous. Things like what? Like a baby crying in the night, Carlo answered. What's strange about that? My friends didn't answer. They were looking at each other now. This baby cries in Magusa, Carlo answered. There's a baby crying in any village, I responded, exasperated. Could this get any sillier? But we've all heard it, Maurizio was saying. So? It's just one baby, Maurizio went on, and when it cries, it doesn't stop. He was staring at me, pleading as if to say, Please believe us. I would not lie to you, Brad. And he wouldn't. When? In the night. It can't just be one baby. But it is, Carlo insisted. 
We recognized it. There are no other voices, no people, no children, no other babies. Just this one, and it cries all night. I didn't know what to say. I'd gotten a shiver, the way Carlo was telling it. But that just made me mad because I knew he wanted me to shiver. He loved to scare people. He'd learned it from his dad, who'd have a glass of wine, and off he'd go with a ghost story until the women told him to stop. You're scaring us all, Marco, so Zito, please. So you heard it, Carlo? Yes, he did, said Gianluca. We all did. How? Before you and your family came to live here, Gianluca said. Maybe two years ago, we went to Magusa. We took the fork. We stayed in the groves until night, and we waited. We had flashlights. We wanted to explore the village at night using flashlights, but suddenly we were scared. Something scared us, and we stayed in the trees all night. We thought dogs would smell us or hear us, and we'd have to run, Maurizio said. But they don't have dogs, Gianluca said. What? They don't, Gianluca said again. Have Dogs. You've never heard dogs barking at Magusa? No. No one has, ever. Even the adults say they haven't. They think it's strange, but not strange enough to change how they think. Bene. I agree. I said, that's strange, but a baby crying isn't strange. You're trying to make that village stranger than it is because you just don't want to walk to Romito. No, Maurizio said quietly. That Maurizio believed it, that was what was most persuasive of all. He was the clearest thinker in school, the calmest, the kindest, the most reasonable. And if he believed, I felt a chill again. There was just one infant, Gianluca insisted. I doubt that a village has just one baby. I said, repeating myself, but not wanting to give up that easily. Finding a thing unbelievable was not the same as being afraid to believe it, I knew. We stayed, he went on, in the bushes until after midnight. We knew we would get in trouble with our parents, but we were... You, Jean, were afraid to move even a centimeter, Carlo interrupted smugly. So were you, Jean-Luca glared at him. Carlo said nothing. Gianluca calmed down, looked at me, and went on. All we could do was listen to that baby cry. Until after midnight? Yes, all, all that time. How many hours? Six, maybe a little more. I don't believe you sat in the bushes not moving for six hours. We do not lie, Brad, Maurizio said. You didn't have to go to the bathroom? We went to the bathroom. Right there, in the bushes? Yes. Why? Because we had to go, but we couldn't leave. I was staring at the three of them, looking for any sign on their faces that it was a joke. There was nothing. Mary, Mother of God, I said. You are all crazy. You got yourself scared that night like little kids. You scared each other. You couldn't even move? You went in the grass? They looked at me for a second, and it was Maurizio who spoke. You wouldn't have been able to move either, Brad. Why? Because it was as if the baby were alone. That's what its crying sounded like. As if no one were there to hold it or nurse it. As if all the people in the village were gone, and only the baby was there alone. As if... Maurizio ran out of words and his mouth hung open for a moment. Just one baby, you're sure? Yes. No adult voices? Gianluca sighed. No adult voices anywhere. They were standing on the path with me, and we were all silent. I'd run out of questions and they'd run out of answers. I believed them, I suppose, enough that I was still feeling the whisper of a chill. But I sure had no idea what it meant. So, let's go, I said. What? They said. It was the exact opposite of what they wanted to hear. 
I was supposed to be scared now. I was supposed to want to go anywhere but Magusa. Let's take the fork, I went on. Let's find out what it means. It's daytime. There are four of us. What do we have to be afraid of? They'd all stepped back as if I'd sprayed them with a hose. I know why I said it. I was angry. I was angry that they'd scared me with their story and I wanted to get back at them. I didn't really want to go to Magusa now, and they didn't either, so the last thing I expected was Carlo's next words. Va bene. Let's go. What? Now it was my turn. You're right, Brad. The time to go there is daytime, when there are as many of us as possible. Besides... I didn't know what the besides meant, but the others did. Besides? You're an American, and that may protect us. If they're communists, I countered, they certainly won't want to see an American. Maybe, Carlo said. If they're communists. But what may protect us? The others were nodding now as if they'd all talked about it. Is your red hair? If they are, as our parents say, from the South, that should frighten them. Barbarossa, the devil's beard, the evil eye. It wouldn't frighten Northerners because they have red hair sometimes. Look at Nardi, but if they're Southerners, maybe they'll think you're the devil. I wanted to say, and what if they are the devil? But I didn't. I was suddenly very self-conscious of my hair. We don't think you're the devil, jean Luca said, as if I needed the assurance. But Carlo is right. Maybe they will. Again, I thought they were joking. How could they say such a thing with a straight face? But they weren't smiling. They weren't laughing. It should, Carlo added somberly like an old priest, give you power over them. It is daylight, too, little Maurizio added brightly, so they will see your hair better. I wanted to laugh, to break the tension and help me breathe, but for some reason the idea of my own laughter scared me even more than Carlo's tone. So we did it. We took the fork. Our hearts were beating louder than our footsteps on the cobbles, at least mine was, and we kept scanning the shadows of the olive groves on either side of us like soldiers looking for an enemy. The cobbles on the fork were rougher, and we tripped a lot. Our eyes on the trees where things could hide, watching us. No one said a thing, as if speaking would bring the shadows to life, and it took an hour to reach the village when it should have taken half that. I looked at innocent Maurizio. He looked back, and I knew what he was thinking. See how much sunlight there is here, Brad? They'll be able to see your red hair perfectly. It almost glows. The village was about a block long. No one was on the path that led through it or in the doorways that lined it. No voices reached us from anywhere, houses or olive groves beyond them. No one was there to watch us arrive, and no one appeared as we walked past the doorways with their red paint. I had walked this path once before with my parents not long after we'd arrived in Larici. We'd been taking a Sunday walk to the Villa Mitiale on the ridge to say hello to the Contessa, who'd befriended my mother in our first weeks in the country, as the aristocracy of any country tends to do with military officers, who are, after all, the military's own aristocracy, and we'd taken the Magusa Fork by accident. I hadn't paid much attention. I was chubbier then, completely out of shape, and walking that far uphill had winded me. I saw the red paint and knew what hammers and sickles were, so when my father pointed them out, calling them just that, I nodded. Then he said, Have we been here before? And my mother said, No, Jimmy, we haven't, and I'm really not sure we should be here. I'm not sure either, he answered quickly. Their instant of fear made me afraid too. An American family, a symbol of oppression, as the newspapers put it, to the downtrodden here, should not be wandering into a little village so off the beaten track and so full we knew of ardent communists. It wasn't that I really thought the townspeople would hurt us, clubs or knives or fists or anything like that. It was simply that I didn't want to be screamed at, which had already happened to us on a bus tour in Rome, 
but I also didn't want to insult them by walking where I shouldn't walk. Their lives were hard. You could tell that from the tiny, dark, and damp houses they lived in. You could tell from the size of their doorways. If you're a symbol of wealth and power, something they'd never had and never would have, why would you want to rub it in? Parading up their cobblestone path, a red-haired boy, a tall, blue-eyed father of military bearing, a pretty mother in a nice dress, all three so very American. If you did that, maybe you deserved to be shouted at, I told myself. That day with my parents, no one had come out of the houses either. It had been a Sunday afternoon, and no one would be in the groves picking olives or pruning the trees or weeding under them, and yet no one was on the path or in the doorways. What a strange little town, I thought, but nothing more. When we mentioned it later to my tutor that we had taken that path by accident, the dottore, a dignified man from La Spezia, who held his cigarettes tightly as if they might somehow escape him, said, Please do not do that again, Capitano. That is not an appropriate place for an officer and his family, American or Italian. Even he did not seem to feel it had been that dangerous an outing, only that Magusa was a place where upper-class people should not, by propriety, go. No more than that. No more dangerous than Naples in daylight. Just common sense. Common sense in a world where social classes did not always get along, Capitano. As my three friends and I walked through the village now, the hammers and sickles didn't look much like hammers and sickles at all. About that, my friends had been right. The crude design looked more like a big crescent moon with a cross slapped over it. At first, I told myself it had been easier, faster, for whoever had painted them to do it this way. You make a crescent for the sickle, leave off the handle, and paint the hammer so fast it looks like a cross. Everyone will still know what it is, right? But as we walked on, I saw that every doorway had it exactly the same. Sickle without a handle, ends tapering like a crescent moon, and the cross definitely a cross. Some of the designs were large, some small, and couldn't have been made by the same person, and yet the design was always the same. Crescent moon and cross. You're right, I said at last. Those aren't hammers and sickles. Of course not, Carlo answered proudly, as if I were complimenting him. A sound farther up the path made us freeze. Where the last houses were on the path, just up ahead, a door had started to open. My heart jumped, and I knew what the others were thinking because I was thinking it too. Now it's going to happen. Someone is going to step from a house and start screaming at us. But isn't that better than what we'd imagined? But it didn't happen. Instead, from the doorway, a head peered out. It was too far away to see whether it was man or woman, and it peered at us for a second, even as a hand reached down to pick something up from the cobbles in front of the doorway. Then the hand stopped, withdrew, the head disappeared, and the door closed. When the door stayed closed, we started walking again, and when we reached the front of that doorway, slowed. There, on the cobbles, was a bucket, and inside it, paint. Red paint, the surface starting to harden, the paint separating into different fluids. That's what it looked like, anyway, as we reached the bucket, looked down in it, and found ourselves stopping to stare. We didn't want to stop. We didn't want the person inside the house to step out and start screaming at us. Who do you think you are? Ragazzi maleducati, sons of engineers and draftsmen, children of privilege? With an American boy with you as well? But we couldn't stop looking at the paint. It was obviously the paint they used on the doors. It was what they used to make the hammers and sickles that weren't hammers and sickles at all. Carlo, always the bravest of us, or the most full of bravado, was leaning, actually leaning, over the bucket to get a good look, saying, What is that? What is what? I said. I could see inside the bucket from where I stood, but I certainly wasn't going to get as close as Carlo was to it. That, he said, pointing at the paint. 
We looked in all directions to make sure we were safe, and then, as if given permission by God or someone, crowded around the bucket. There were three layers of fluid in the bucket. There was the bright red paint, but also two layers on top of that, one a clear yellowish fluid, like what comes from a cut on your finger, and the other a clotted material that was red too, but darker than the paint below it. We all stepped back, even Carlo. Not everything in that bucket is paint, we were thinking. But if it isn't paint, in the bucket was a stick, one from an olive tree, one that had been used to mix the paint and that was covered with all three, yellow fluid, dark clots, bright red paint. That's blood, Carlo said, sure of himself. No one argued. Carlo moved suddenly and we all jumped. He was reaching down with his right hand and with his index finger, touching it. Are you Pazzo? Gianluca whispered hoarsely, taking another step back, as if the bucket were going to explode and we'd all be covered with what was in it. That's blood, Carlo. I know, idiota, Carlo answered. He had touched the dark clots and was raising his finger to look at it. Carlo might have been the bravest of us, but he also needed to make sure we knew it, and sometimes this made him do stupid things. Wipe it off! Wipe it off! Gianluca was whispering. Why? Because! Because! Carlo was smelling his fingertip now, and I was ready to scream too. It was so close to his face, his eyes, his mouth. Wipe it off, I said. Please, Carlo, we know you're brave. This annoyed him. He glared at me. Don't you want to be brave too? He asked. No, I said. He started to wipe it on his shorts, and Gianluca grabbed his arm. Not your shorts! He wiped it instead on the lip of the bucket, and as he did, the door opened. We didn't even look, we just started running. You'd think it would take a shouting voice to make you run faster, but that day in Magusa it was the silence of whoever stood in that doorway behind us, someone we never turned to see that made us run faster. Just one baby crying in the night, I remember thinking as I ran. No one there on a Sunday, no one ever there, hammers and sickles that were moons and crosses, buckets that held more than paint. I heard later from Gianluca that Carlo developed a rash on his hand, the hand that had touched what was in the bucket, but who knows whether that was true. Carlo was always putting his nose and his hands where they didn't belong, all I know is that we ran as hard as we did from Magusa that day, on to Romito and ice cream that wasn't so great after all, because of the silence, and a baby we never even heard. It never occurred to me that the village of red paint would get me to return, and return alone, for a dog. When the village called again, I was two years older and, I liked to think, tougher. The way that life's lessons make you tougher. One of the three old women, the witches, Strege, who lived in the olive groves near our house, had poisoned my cat, Niev, that first year in Larici. I had watched the little thing die in my bathtub, and then, because I was sure which witch had poisoned her, had made my way to the old woman's stone hut wearing my anger proudly, only to learn that she had lost even more and that the poisoning, a trick of magic, had been a mistake. A year after that, I'd stood up for a working-class friend, Emilio, whose family lived in a dark, tiny apartment attached to the convent down the road from us, against both my tutor's snobbery and the merciless teasing of another American boy, a bully whose father was also stationed at the center, and because I did, seen magic at work again, in the way the little metal cross on my friend's wall had glowed faintly until the bullying stopped. And throughout our stay, my mother, frustrated that she couldn't teach because she didn't know the language well enough, had too much time to sit and think, to think about my baby brother who'd died when I was four from meningitis, and thinking of him, to cry and sometimes not be able to stop crying. I'd gotten stronger in two years, 
In other words, and was now as good as my dad at consoling her when she was feeling her darkness, when her eyes were like shadows, and her crying no longer scared me, I was able to give her what light I could. That is what love is, isn't it? A light we give? And sometimes it was enough. In other words, I'd grown up a lot in two years, or at least told myself I had. And if I was older and had grown up a lot, I must be tougher. And if I was tougher, I must be on my way to becoming a man. I'd read enough stories about boys and men and their dogs to know that if I wanted to be a man, I did need a dog. Not a cat, a dog. Real men didn't have cats, everyone knew that. And so soon I was petting every dog, mongrels especially, or big purebreds, I could find in the village, all the while daydreaming of my own. Without that thought, that you couldn't be a man without a dog, I'm sure I'd never have followed Chichio to Magusa that night. The dog in question was a white, mid-sized mongrel with a few large black spots, the kind of coloration dairy cows sometimes have but it was no cow. It was as skinny as a greyhound, nervous as hell, and had appeared one day in our backyard, which angled from the back patio up into the olive groves. I heard a yelp and saw our maid, Elisa, with her one blue eye and one white eye, trying to shoo it away. I said, no, let it be. And she smiled the kind smile she always had for me, knowing how much I liked animals, and perhaps feeling in her affection for me that I deserved, for as long as my parents would let me keep it, a dog, even one as scrawny and mongrelly as this one. Va bene, she said. Voi darli da mangiare. Would you like to feed it? Of course. I gave it a hot dog from the refrigerator just the wiener, and when it had gobbled it up, another, and another. Non troppo, she said. Poverino, finirà per sentirsi male. Poor Tommy, it will get sick. Yes, I said. Sometimes pity, even compassion, can hurt another, I remember thinking. Elisa went about her business, laundry and mopping, and I sat on the flagstone stairs and petted the creature, whose coarse and dirty coat was a miracle to me. It was a dog, after all, and that's all that mattered. It had no collar. It might have been a runaway from one of the villages high in the hills. And it might soon be mine. It sat beside me for a while, hoping I might give it more, and when I didn't, it began to wander off. I called to it. It stopped, looked at me, saw nothing in my hand, and kept on, disappearing into the grove next to us. I was disappointed, sure, but what could I do? Even if I petted it until my hand was numb, the dog would be thinking of and worrying about food, and so would keep moving. But the dog was back the next day, and around the same time. It had a cut over its right eye, and that worried me. It seemed healthy otherwise, though, and I wondered whether it was making the rounds going from Villetta to Villetta on Via San Giuseppe like a panhandler who knew who to hit up for money. Or had it come to our house, just ours, after rooting for food in the alleys down by the waterfront because it remembered the wieners and the petting, and maybe even because it liked me. I fed him for six straight days, wieners until they were gone, then old bread from the bakery near the school, then cans of cat food Nieve had never had a chance to eat, then leftovers from one dinner after another, and he returned each day in the afternoon as if he knew that on school days, at least, I wouldn't be home until then. I was mustering the courage to ask my parents if I could keep him. We had no other pets, and though my mother talked constantly of getting a cat to replace poor little Nieve, I knew it wasn't going to happen. My mother was afraid of things dying, and had good reason to be. Please, I rehearsed silently. I've never had a dog before, and I'm old enough to take care of one, to be responsible for him, and I really, really, really want one. My speech needed work, especially the realies, and I kept working on it. On the seventh day, he didn't return. I'd been calling him Ciccio, a joke, since Ciccio means chubby, and he had started on the fourth day to answer to his name. When he didn't appear on the seventh, 
I wandered around the olive groves near us, calling to him, but with no luck. Back at the house, I took cardboard from the trash, put two wieners on it, and laid them on the low wall in the backyard where the olive groves began, the ones that continued up the hill to Magusa and on to the old villas of the wealthy. The next morning, the wieners were untouched, and I gave up rehearsing my speech. I knew what it meant. I was old enough to have heard that wandering dogs usually keep wandering, and that was better than thinking he'd been hurt, or worse. Two days later, after a big test on Garibaldi's diary that I'd studied hard for with my friends, I was in the backyard moving the trash cans and heard another yelp. It was from far away, up in the groves where the cobblestone path wound toward the hilltops, toward Magusa and Romito and the villas, so I thought nothing of it. A dog, someone's dog, not mine. Then it yelped again, louder this time, and I went to the low wall to look over it. There, far up the hillside in the olive grove, was what certainly looked like Ciccio. He yelped again, started toward me in the grass, and then stopped, as if someone had jerked him back. I blinked, trying to see. Was someone holding him on a leash? But I couldn't see any leash. I couldn't see any someone. Just grass, olive trees, and Ciccio. He yelped again, tried to move toward me, and again, something I couldn't see jerked him back. Was he tangled in something? Had he stepped in a trap of some kind? I climbed over the wall and began toward him. There was no tree near him. No rope, no net, no trap that I could see. His feet were free. What held him had him by the throat, jerking him again and again, but I couldn't see it. Red doorways flashed before my eyes. Even with my eyes open, I could see them, and I felt a pull, the kind my friends had said they felt at the fork in the cobblestone path, the kind I'd never felt until now. Ciccio, I called, feeling a chill on my skin that had nothing to do with any breeze, and walked faster. He whimpered and yelped in response, looking at me, trying to break away from what held him. No matter how far and fast I walked up the hillside, through the trees, the distance between us somehow remained the same. It was like a dream where your feet don't work, where you want to run but can't. He would dig in his paws, struggling against the invisible leash, and I'd get maybe twenty feet closer. But then the invisible hand would pull at him again so hard he'd be wrenched around, fall, scramble up, and be dragged farther up the hill again toward... toward what pulled at me, too. The path. The fork. The doorways. If you don't follow him, the breeze in the trees whispered, whatever has him will have him forever. I was panting hard, walking as fast as I could, jogging when the hillside flattened even for a moment, but the invisible hand was even faster. When he disappeared suddenly over a little rise into tall grass, I was sure I had lost him. But as I came over the rise, stopping to catch my breath, there he was, sitting as dogs sit, panting, too, happy to see me, his rump on the cobblestone fork. And then he jerked, jerked again, and the invisible leash pulled him roughly once more toward Magusa. The sun was beginning to fade. It was probably six o'clock now, and if I were to save him, though I had no idea how I would do that, it would have to be soon. As the first houses of Magusa came into view, Ciccio did what I hoped he wouldn't. He was yanked suddenly to the side, left the path fell, got up, and began half running and half falling again, but to where? How would I see him in the groves without light? He had left the path just before the village began, and so I left it too, running, now dodging back and forth to make sure I could still see his whiteness among the trees, afraid that if I lost sight of him I would not, in the wind that had come up, hear his whine or yelps. Why he was approaching the houses from the groves, why the invisible leash wanted this, I didn't know. 
I expected to see at least a few lights from the houses, but there were none. In the growing shadows of the groves, I hit my head on something, slowed, looked up, squinted, and saw around me what looked like bags, burlap bags, some large, some smaller, hanging from tree limbs. I didn't stop to inspect them. I'd lose Chicho if I did. And if they were important, wouldn't my friends have mentioned them from their night in the groves? Maybe they held olive-picking tools. Maybe they contained food that was being aged, dried. It didn't matter. What mattered was that I kept my eyes on the flashes of white that were Chicho. Then I lost him again. It was near the back of one of the little houses, and all of a sudden his flashes were gone. My heart flipped and began to beat hard enough that I could hear it in my ears. Then I heard a cough. Yes, a cough. And I froze. When the cough came again, I stepped behind a dark, gnarled trunk that couldn't possibly hide me if anyone really looked. I could see the back of the little house through the trees in the deepening darkness, but I couldn't see who coughed. There was a wall, the height of an ordinary man, blocking any view of a backyard. A gate in that wall was open, but there was no one by it. The cough came again, closer to the house, and I heard a door shut. I stepped toward the gate, and as I did, another bag hit me in the head. I looked up at it, but it was too dark to see clearly. I rubbed the side of my head, felt a wetness, but didn't bother looking at my hand in the dim light. I was to the open gate in two or three strides, and there, sitting upright on the moss of a tiny walled-in yard, was Chicho, staring straight ahead, perfectly still, making no sound. I wanted to shout his name, but this was no place to make noise. I took a step, expecting Chicho to hear me, but he didn't move. He kept staring. It was as if he were deaf. I was in plain sight now. He should have seen me, but he still didn't move. And blind. I took another step, through the gate this time, and stopped breathing. There, in the yard, two in one corner, one in the other, were three other dogs, a big black hairy one, and two about Chicho's size, just as mongrelly. They, too, were sitting and staring, motionless, silent. Whatever holds them, I remember thinking, is magic, and who am I to stop magic? There were four buckets of paint, too, in the middle of the mossy yard, and a stool beside them. Watching to make sure the other dogs didn't wake from their spells, I inched slowly into the yard. Whatever held the animals held them tightly. Each bucket, I could now see, had a stick, just like the one in the bucket my friends and I had looked into that day in Magusa, and each bucket seemed to be full of paint, too. And what else? I wondered. And then, as the wind picked up even more, I happened to look up at the one tree in the little yard. I don't know why I looked. There had been no sound, nothing had moved in the tree. Perhaps I'd seen it, the bag hanging there from the corner of my eye. Perhaps I'd even seen it dripping, like the bag that had touched my head. Whatever made me look, I squinted and nearly screamed. It wasn't a very large bag, much smaller than Chicho, but a dog's head, its eyes closed, was sticking from the top of it, and there was something else. I didn't want to see it, but I had to. I stepped toward the tree, squinted again, and saw what was sticking from the bag just behind the head. A dog's leg, a leg that had been skinned, what was dripping from the bag was blood, the dead dog's blood. My heart thundered so loudly I couldn't think. Dog and leg and bag and blood floated in my head like snapshots, like a strange family album, and I thought I was going to faint. My hands shook, and my legs, which were cold now in my shorts, were shaking just as hard. Can people hear it when we shake? My head asked stupidly. Can people hear it when our hearts thunder? I could, I knew, be killed as easily as the dog had been killed. It wouldn't even take magic to kill me. 
All it would take was a man or two and whatever weapons, whatever tools they had, even bare hands. No one would hear me. Magusa was too far away. I needed to run to get away from this place, and it didn't matter what direction I ran. But I couldn't run, not without Ciccio. I stepped over to him, and the instant I touched his head, I was afraid to, but more afraid not to. He looked up as if waking from a dream, whined, stood up, and began to move in little jerks as if his legs weren't yet working. I'd broken the spell, that was obvious. But if he yelped or whined, we might still be caught. I picked him up, hoping it would calm him, but it scared him, and he flopped and flailed in my arms. I lost my grip. He hit the ground, and all I could do was hold him by the skin of his neck to talk to him gently. Don't make a sound, Ciccio. I'm here. I'm here. I heard the cough again inside the house, and then footsteps. Ciccio whimpered once, and for a moment the footsteps stopped, only to start again and get louder. Telling Ciccio, stay. I ran to the two smaller dogs and touched them, ran to the big black dog to touch him as well, and as their spells broke too, the yard exploded in noise and motion. Dogs running this way and that, the two smaller ones snapping at each other and the big black one woofing like a cannon. At that very moment, a figure opened the back door and stepped out, brandishing a big knife, one covered with something that glistened and that I knew wasn't paint. The figure was small, but in the faint light that fell upon him he didn't look like any southerner I'd ever seen. My father had taken us to Naples the summer before, and the summer before that we'd taken a cruise to Sicily and Libya, and this man looked nothing at all like the men I'd seen in those countries. He was squat, his head just as squat as his body, his ears like handles, his teeth too small for his mouth, and his face hairless. I expected him to shout or scream, but, like the head that had appeared in the doorway that day with my friends, he made no sound. He moved, however, and it was toward me that he came. The only thing that allowed Ciccio and me to escape was the two snarling little dogs and the big booming black dog, all of whom decided at the same moment to flee before the man could reach them too. We all collided at the gate, but with a common mission— to get away from that knife, so no one snarled, no one bit, and in a moment Ciccio and I were out into the grove again. It was dark, and the bags, dozens of them, hung from the trees like strange fruit. All I could do was run and try to duck them. We had gone only a dozen yards when Ciccio stopped suddenly and began to back up. For a moment I imagined the invisible leash had gotten him again, but his legs were moving differently this time. He was whining, the way dogs do when they're afraid, and backing up the way dogs do. I squinted into the darkness and saw something move. In the corner of my eye, even closer to us, I saw something else move too, and a bag in a tree started swaying. There, Straight ahead of us and silhouetted by the last light of the sun was an upright figure taller than any man, and to our left, where the bag was swaying, another figure tall enough that its head was in the tree branches. It was pushing at a bag with its snout, snuffling and sniffing. Other than that, the two creatures made no sound, seemingly unaware of us, though that might change. I could smell them. It had to be them, the smell of dogs, but not the kind you kept on your lap or let sleep on your bed, not Ciccio's kind of dog. It was the smell of a wild animal, wet, filthy, and rancid from what it ate. A dog bigger than any other dog, and upright, a creature from a dark dream. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to scream. I wanted to lie down, cover my face, go to sleep, and wake up from the nightmare of it. But Ciccio was whining next to me, backing up still, and I knew what we had to do, crazy as it was. We had to return to the village. Whatever was in the olive groves, and I didn't want to imagine what the faces of creatures as tall as olive branches, creatures that might sniff and swat at bags with dead dogs in them might look like, we were not going to get past them if we stayed in the grove. And frightening though the village was, 
It couldn't be any scarier than this. Ciccio didn't need me to call his name. When I turned and began running, he was at my side. I listened for heavy bodies behind us, heard nothing, but could not be sure. When they ran, did the creatures fall to four legs or did they run like men? Were their footsteps loud or as quiet as wolves? We wouldn't be able to cut between the houses to reach the cobblestone path. The houses touched. We would have to stay in the groves until we reached the path, and this we did, stumbling from the grass and trees onto the cobblestones and into the village at last. There was moonlight, at least. I remember feeling grateful for that. Not much, a bright, crescent moon, if any crescent moon could be called bright, but more light than there'd been in the groves behind the house. Looking behind me for the creatures, I twisted my ankle on a cobble and fell. Ciccio waited for me to catch up, and when I reached him we both stopped for a moment to look up the path that ran between the houses, between the doorways with their paint and blood, the blood of dogs. There was no one on the path except us, no doors started to open, no voices in the houses. And then I heard the baby cry. I thought it was a whine from Ciccio, but the sound came again, and it was indeed a baby's cry. There were no other voices, just the baby's. And cry it did, as if there would never, ever be anyone to pick it up and hold it. As Ciccio and I stared at the empty path, we saw the creatures. We'd expected them from the groves behind us, but there they were ahead of us somehow, I started to turn, ready to run once more, but these creatures too seemed not to see us. They'd been there on the path all along, I realized suddenly, but we just hadn't seen them. They'd been down on all fours, and now some of them were standing up. They were looking at something on the path. The ones still on all fours were pawing at the cobbles. Those that had stood were staring and sniffing at the air. Ciccio didn't move beside me. He didn't whimper, and for a moment I was afraid the invisible leash had gotten him once more. But he was only hypnotized, just as I was, by the sight of the creatures, their big heads and chests, their long, sinewy legs, their fur, all of it lit faintly now by the crescent moon. Was this how an ordinary dog, the kind that men knew and loved, acted when it felt true terror? paralyzed? The sight and smell and soundless sounds of dogs so large that their jaws could snap you in half, and yet walking upright like your master? Was this what ordinary dogs dreamed when they kicked in their sleep, whined in the worst nightmares of their innocent, loyal lives? Three of the creatures, there were six in all, were down on all fours, sniffing and pawing at the cobbles, while two remained upright looking at the same spot, and a sixth sniffed at the nearest doorway but didn't touch it. It sniffed the wood, the paint, jerked back again and again from what it smelled, and finally, as if tired of the impasse, returned to the five who were so intent on the stone path and whatever was there. The baby still cried. It wasn't in a house. It wasn't in the groves. It was as if the sound were coming from the ground, from the cobbles themselves. I squinted, and there in the cobblestones at the creature's feet, I saw a faint light glowing. How could light be coming from cobbles? I took a step, then another, ready to run if the creatures turned to look at us. I managed four steps and squinted again. The light was indeed coming from the cobbles, as if through a crack in the pavement, and the creatures hadn't noticed us yet simply because they wanted so badly to get to that light. The baby kept crying, and the crying came from the light. How was it possible? There was something, a room, a space of some kind, under the cobblestone path, a place lit by a light, and in that space the baby cried. There was no other explanation. The creatures wanted the light because they wanted the baby. They wanted the baby's blood. I don't know how I knew this, but I did. It made sense of everything. 
The creatures were going crazy. They were pawing frantically at the cobbles, at the light, at the sound coming from the light. They were smelling things I couldn't imagine, and the smells were driving them crazy too. Two had broken away from the group and were sniffing at doors, daring to touch them, now pushing hard with their snouts, pawing with long paws, then jerking back as if the paint made them sick. And why not? I remember thinking, dog's blood, the wrong blood, the blood of kin. The baby had stopped, but was starting again. And then one of the creatures saw us. Perhaps it was Chicho. Perhaps the creature smelled him, a brother. Perhaps it was my smell, or perhaps we'd made a sound. Perhaps in its hysteria it had looked everywhere and its eyes had finally fallen on us. The creature stared at us, and as it did, its brethren turned in our direction too, stood up, and cocked their heads. It was a dog they were seeing, a cousin, skinny and white with black spots, and that was all right. But there was something else standing by that dog, something upright and hairless and not unlike the baby that cried forever in the night. They began toward us. I wanted Chicho to run, to run to safety. They don't want you, I wanted to shout. But of course he didn't run. He started barking furiously and took a step toward them. No, Chicho! I grabbed him by the skin of the neck. He turned, snarled, stopped when he saw it was me, and let me pick him up. Back legs kicking as if running for us both. Barely able to carry him, I stumbled toward the nearest doorway. Whatever was inside the house would not, I told myself, be as bad as what was coming towards us. And there was no way I could outrun them whether they dropped to all fours or stayed upright. The door was unlocked, and I remember thinking giddily, why not? The villagers knew the creatures couldn't enter. The crescent moon and cross and dog's blood would stop them, and the doorways were too small anyway for them to get through. The villagers knew this because it had been happening for a long time. The squat, smooth-skinned people and the dog creatures, the doorways and the crying baby. Perhaps at the beginning there had been no paint at all, just blood, old, dark blood making the sign of the crescent moon and the cross. Perhaps, I thought giddily, the cross had been a... I got us both inside and shut the door. Would there be a crash? Would the hinges hold? Would the creatures even try? Would there instead be a squat man in the darkness with a knife, a dog-skinning knife, who'd kill us both and put us in bags and hang us in the trees? Nothing happened. There was no crash. No man in the dark came at us. There may have been sniffing and snuffling on the other side of the door, but how would I know I was panting too loudly? I couldn't even tell if Chicho was whining in my arms. I blinked and saw a faint light near the floor. There was no light from another room. No light through windows, if there were any windows. Just that faint light near the floor. I put Chicho down, and he stayed. When my eyes had adjusted as much as they were going to, I could see that the light was a crack in the floor, and when I stepped over to it, that there was a handle on the floor, one dimly lit by that light. There was a door in the floor, that's what it was, and the light was the same light that had been driving the creatures crazy outside. I took the handle and started to pull up. The baby was crying again. I could hear it now, and it wasn't coming from outside, from the path. It was coming, like the light itself, from below us, under the door in the floor. I started to pull again on the handle and stopped. Why wasn't I afraid of what was below me, the light, the crying baby? Because, a voice said, and it was my own, I know, the wisest one in me, wherever the baby is, the creatures cannot be. So I lifted the door in the floor and found the dirt and stone stairs I knew somehow would be there, ones lit faintly by the light somewhere beyond them. Chicho didn't want to go. I had to pull him onto the stairs with me, quickly shutting the door over us. 
We followed both the baby's crying and the light, which grew brighter as we stepped from the last stone stair onto the bare earth, turned right into a passageway, and began to walk under what I knew was the front of the house. Where the creatures, no doubt, still stood, trying to figure out how to reach the light that was driving them so crazy. I don't know if I'm leaving things out when I say, as I always do, that we reached at last the big room, and the villagers there, and the baby in the center of them all. I have told this story, the story of Magusa, many times in my life, and though I'm sure I have gotten some things wrong, I've remembered what matters most. The immense underground room, the villagers of Magusa filling it silently, the baby on a stone table in the center, crying. Hundreds of votive candles in the corners of the room to light it. Lanterns on the dirt walls. And the light, though gentle and flickering, bright enough to shine through a crack in the cobblestone path above. Is all of this true? It must be, since what we experience when we are young is burned like God's truth into our brains. What I saw that night while my parents worried where I was, is as true as anything I have ever lived, and why I will tell this story again and again until my lips can no longer make the words. When Chichio and I reached the great room, our noses full of dust, candle smoke, and something else, something metallic I'd smelled in the little yard where I'd saved Chichio from the man's knife. The villagers were there, all of them, even the same squat man with the knife, and they were all there because the baby was bleeding. They stood around it, watched it, and did more than watch. But they were not what I was looking at. I was looking at the baby. He was as dark-skinned as they were, but a baby like any other. He was naked on the stone table, an ancient, worn thing, and all I could think for a moment was how cold, how incredibly cold he must be. To be alive, to be crying for someone to hold you, and yet to lie on cold stone, what must it be like, my child, to do this forever? For he had indeed been doing it forever. This I knew, too. And I recognized the metallic smell, the smell of copper, the smell of blood. The baby was bleeding. He was bleeding slowly, and he was bleeding a lot. But this was not why he was crying. He felt nothing as he bled. He was crying for his mother, who wasn't there, and never would be, for she had died long ago. The stone table under him, which was sloped, had little channels, and it was down these channels that his blood, red and bright like the paint on the doors, moved like honey into little cups. Some stone, some ceramic, some metal, all old and chipped and bent. As he cried and would not stop crying for someone who could not come. My brother, in the year of life he'd had, had cried that way too but someone had always come. Perhaps it was the way the villagers were standing, waiting patiently, or the way the baby lay on his back, arms and legs still, no one stepping to him, as if he, the baby, had the power and they did not. That told me how long this had been happening. Whether it happened only at crescent moons or at other times as well, it did not happen every night, I knew. It had not happened the night my friends had stayed the night in the trees, since they had met no dog creatures. To bleed forever. He was bleeding from his hands and feet, from wounds he'd been born with that would always bleed, and the villagers knew this, as their ancestors had known it, just as they knew that all they had to do to get the blood they needed in order to live forever, too, was wait for the right moon and keep the creatures away, and let the baby bleed. Born too soon, or too late, a voice said quietly, and whether it was a voice from the room, the village, or my own mind making sense of what should make no sense, I'll never know. 
Born too soon or too late, the voice said again. And it was true. A mistake. An infant who would never take his true place in the world, even if he lived forever. There were four old women standing apart from the group, and it didn't take a genius to know who and what they were. They were the women who protected the village and the baby. From the creatures who came every crescent moon, the creatures who wanted his blood too. For what creature does not wish to live forever? They were the strege, who knew the spells that could drag dogs on invisible leashes to the village, who knew how to mix a paint that wasn't a paint, who knew the design a door should have and how big the doorway should be. They hadn't invented this magic themselves. They had learned it from old women before them, and that was enough to keep their story going. These are the women of the moon and the blood, the voice said. These are the women who protect a child who isn't theirs and give a village what it has needed for a thousand years. I wanted to go to the child, and I knew why. If I did, perhaps, a part of me whispered, I would find my baby brother there, pick him up and hold him, then take him home at last. But he wasn't my brother. The idea was crazy, and the villagers would stop me anyway. They would have to. The squat man would produce his knife, and there would be the end. Neither I nor Ciccio had made a sound, but a little girl turned at that moment and saw us. Her mother had given her a cup. The girl had drunk from it slowly, eyes closed, as if trying to taste what could not be tasted. And when she handed the cup back to her mother, she happened to look our way. She stared for a moment, tugged at her mother's black dress, and her mother turned too. I'd imagined a shout would go up. I was sure one would. Ciccio and I had violated this room, discovered their secret, and a shout would go up. The villagers would swarm over us, and we would be beaten, perhaps killed. And why shouldn't we be? To intrude on their story. But a shout did not go up. A dozen faces were looking at us now, then another dozen, heads turning like echoes of a thought. But there were no shouts, no mutterings, and no knives. They just stared at the pale, red-haired boy and his skinny dog who were standing in the archway to the great room. They stared and blinked, and what I saw in their faces, their wide-set eyes that had seen the centuries pass and would see more, world without end, was not anger or insanity or fear. It was a sadness, and below that, a shame. I didn't understand it. And then, of course, did. They had no choice. They had to drink his blood, the child's, to keep living. And because they did, they would never be free. They, too, are forsaken. So the villagers stared at the boy and his dog, both of whom were free to live, love and die. And as they did, felt their prison even more, tasting it on their lips, on the rims of battered cups, in the coppery air, in the blood of a child that would cry for them forever. Ciccio fidgeted beside me, and I fidgeted back. We were free to go, but where? The creatures were still out there on the path and in the groves and would be there all night. So I headed Ciccio beside me toward the flickering torches that led to the stairs and to the one-room house above them. No one followed. The villagers had turned away. Only the little girl and two boys kept staring at us and were again waiting for their cups to be filled. It would take all night, and it would take forever. The stone floor of the house, the one with the door in its floor, was cold, but there was a blanket, one I found by crawling from corner to corner, touching everything I could until I found it. It was wadded up in a corner and smelled of sweat, ordinary sweat, and of something else, something 
Strange, but I wasn't going to be picky. I wrapped myself in it, and Ciccio lay down beside me. We would keep each other as warm as we could. We woke twice to the sounds of footsteps near us. I expected bodies to lie down beside us or voices to tell us to leave, but neither happened. The footsteps stopped both times, and the room fell silent again. Dawn light woke Ciccio first. There was one tiny window in the wall facing the groves, and dogs always wake before men. I woke a second later and looked around the room, at the little table and chairs I'd touched in the darkness, at the stone and mortar walls, and at the door to another room, one I hadn't known was there. I got up, folded the blanket, put it in a corner, and led Ciccio out, closing the door behind us quietly in case people were sleeping in that other room. There was no one on the cobblestone path, but I could hear men talking in the groves beyond the houses. Olive picking was what they did in the day. What they did with their lives that wasn't magic, and what they'd done in every country on this sea, this olive-growing sea since the beginning. It was the one thing, the only thing, that had let them live like ordinary men and women. When I got home, my parents were relieved, but angry, too, as all parents are when their children scare them. I lied. I told them I'd hidden in an abandoned hut in the groves all night because three boys, ones who were probably drug users from Parma in Reggio Emilia, had chased me at sunset when I was looking for Ciccio, and how one even had a knife, and how I'd been too scared to leave the hut, fallen asleep, and woken only at dawn. But at least I'd found Ciccio, see? They believed me. What other story would make sense? I wasn't a bad boy. I didn't drink beer with friends. How could I? My friends drank wine and only at meals. I didn't vandalize property, and no one my age in the village had a girlfriend. My mother cried for a while, as if worrying about me had reminded her of my brother. My dad sighed. Anger was never really his way, and kept patting me on the back in that gentle way of his. He even patted Ciccio to let me know, man to man, that everything was okay. I didn't tell my friends what really happened. They'd have had question after question, and it would have taken days to explain, and maybe they'd have believed me and maybe not. Mainly, they'd have been mad, feeling left out. Friends can be that way. You almost got killed? Wonderful! Why didn't you take us with you? I did worry about the child. But when, a few weeks later, unable to keep quiet any longer, I started to tell my dad how I'd heard a baby crying in Magusa, as if someone were hurting it, my dad said, I'm not surprised, Brad, but there's nothing to do about it. Didn't your friends tell you? Magusa is empty. Everyone's gone. The olive trees in those groves have a blight and the Carbinieri think they've gone to the mountains to join the more radical communists around Montalcino. Well, that certainly makes sense. I'm sorry about the baby. By the way, how did you hear it crying, Brett? I didn't answer, and he didn't press. He looked at me strangely for a few days, and then the conversation was forgotten. My parents let me keep Ciccio, of course. He slept in my room after we bathed and defleed him, and I had him for a good week before he ran away. It wasn't any invisible leash that took him. He'd been acting stir-crazy, and the last time I saw him he was down by the wharf letting a fisherman pet him. I called to him. He looked around, saw me, but didn't come, and didn't return home that night, either. Wandering dogs usually keep wandering, I remembered and that was okay. It was okay, I told myself even then, to know love and magic, to have good friends or a scrawny dog or a terrible night in a village forgotten by God, for just a moment in time, and then move on, living your life as you needed to live it to become what you needed to become. In a world where war sometimes did not feel like war at all, and blood did not always mean dying. This Circus, the World 
by Amber Sparks. It was the empty Jim Beam bottle on its side in the sullen yellow shower, the fluorescent sign flickering on the roof, the bed springs of the room next door in choruses of creaking. It was the stained beige carpet and the way he shouted when he came through the door. It was the way she lay for hours, face down on that carpet, trussed and always with the camera at her back. It was the way the room was sometimes green, was sometimes gray, was sometimes a cheap room to let, and sometimes a cheap roadside motel, and sometimes a cheap county jail cell. But always cheap. Always faded and frayed as the wallpaper that sometimes lined these walls. It was the way the men in suits filed in, talking on their handsets or their earpieces and taking notes and casting eyes back and forth, fishing for visions in the close and clammy air. It was the way she sometimes perched on the vanity, watching him enter as a tall, swift triptych through the mirrors or as a prisoner, battered. It was the way she combed her hair, the way she put on lipstick, the way she dragged mascara through her lashes while she listened to the clock tick on and on. It was the way he said he liked her better without makeup. It was the way he held her throat, the way she didn't scream, the way he called her Alice, though that was not her name, had never been her name. It was the way they both signed the ledger, also not their real names, checking in and out each day, heading home separately, he in his car, she in worn tennis shoes, walking three miles to the bus to her apartment where she washed her face, her arms, her legs, her feet, and toes, her stomach. It was the way she sometimes left him in the bathtub for hours, inches of water wrinkling his thin, white skin, casting him in old man's costume. The way his arms and legs grew thatched and scarred as train tracks, the way she always found fresh flesh to cut. The way the men in suits would take pictures, bending down, frowning at the carpet like crime scene photographers, the way her clothes were always crumpled on that carpet, the way she sometimes wore layers of clothes, the way sometimes there were never enough clothes, the way sometimes there was never enough fabric in the world to cover her over and swallow her under, the way they avoided eye contact, but every now and then their gazes would join, would lock, would jolt them apart, the third rail of desire the way they would sometimes forget to scratch or scream or scrape or otherwise draw blood and would instead hold each other, skin and breath and damaged heart, until they fell asleep in that vibrating bed, stilled now without the meal of quarters. The way they would sometimes turn off the recording devices and stash the cat o' nine tails and the cattle prod and hide the handcuffs in the drawer next to the King James Bible the way they would sometimes dress one another, he in a tux and she in a gown, the way they would bow to one another, the way they would sip champagne and smile politely over their prime rib, the way he would mention moonlight on the Seine, the way she would shiver, the way they would finally say, I love you and I love you too and the way alarms would shriek, and the way the men in suits would invade an army of red ties and bulletproof vests, the way the room would shrink and blacken, the way the room would dim, the way the blood would pool and churn in the bath, the way their names, their real names, would finally echo soft but true in tune like nothing else in this cruel circus called the world when they finally shut off the lights. Some Pictures in an Album by Gary McMahon The book is a slim faux leather photograph album. The front cover is dusty and stained and scratched crudely into the material is a circular design that matches the birthmark behind my right knee. The very edges of the plastic pages are crumpled and torn. It's an ordinary album, something that might be stored in the loft spaces of a million family homes around the country. Nothing strange, nothing unusual. 
Now that my father is dead, it is just another item found among his belongings. But for some reason I'm drawn to this particular album as I sort through his stuff to box it all up and send it to the charity shop. I sit down on the bed in my old bedroom and open the book. Each of the seventeen photographs has its own page. Every white-bordered Polaroid image is positioned perfectly in the center and covered in a thin plastic protective flap. Someone has taken a lot of time to put the album together. A lot of love went into the preparation. I always called him father, not dad. He was never that. He was always just a father. I can't imagine why he would take so much care in the preparation of this album, or why he would have wanted to keep the pictures I find inside. The first photograph shows me standing in front of a high red brick wall. I am six years old. I recognize myself, but it's like looking into a mirror at a reflection that isn't quite right. I'm holding above my head a small silver plastic replica of the F.A. cup with red and white ribbons tied around it. There was a long, thin shadow on the wall beside me. It is 1973, the year Sunderland beat Leeds in the cup final to produce a now legendary example of giant killing. My face is joyous. My rosy cheeks are soft. My reddish hair almost matches the color of the bricks behind me. I am wearing a light blue shirt that looks like it has lighter blue flowers on it. My entire chest is hidden by a red and white rosette and a knitted red and white doll, both pinned to the shirt. The next photograph on the adjoining page shows simply a black door. It looks like the front door to a normal terraced house. The bricks around it are of the same shade of red as those in the previous photo, but they are more weathered. The edge of a window frame can be seen on the right of the shot. The door itself looks old beaten. Paint is flaking off to expose patches of the cheap, pale timber beneath. Over the page is a photograph of me on one of those mechanical animal rides that used to be outside shops on the high street in most English towns. Put in a couple of coins and let your kid ride for a few minutes. This one is a cartoon elephant. I am clutching its ears. My smile is huge. I am wearing a blue woolen hat. My mother, looking so young, so pretty, is standing to the side, smiling shyly. The arm and leg of what I assume to be my father can be seen next to her, the rest of him just clipped out of the frame. My body is slightly blurred because of the motion of the ride, but my face is perfectly still. I seem to be glimpsing something incredible. There is a light in my eyes that is difficult to define. A question occurs to me as I stare at the image. If my parents are both in the shot, who is that taking the photograph? Next up is the outside of a shop, a corner newsagent, Moses and Sons. Faded posters stuck up with tape in the window. A man in a white overcoat can be glimpsed behind the glass standing at a counter. The window display is mostly sweets, with a few piles of comics and magazines. I am standing with my back to the camera looking through the window. My face is reflected in the glass. I am not smiling. At first glance, it appears that I might be crying, but it isn't clear. Perhaps I am simply concentrating on all the sugared treats in the display. There is another figure reflected in the glass window beside me, this one tall and thin. But whoever it is cannot be seen. The door again. At least it looks like the same one. A little older, maybe more worn. This photograph is darker than the last one, so it could have been taken at a different time of day. Later, closer to dark, I begin to suspect that each photograph represents a new time frame. Perhaps a year has passed since the last one. Over the page there are two blank sheets. No photos here, just the empty clear plastic flaps. It's as if a year has been missed or deliberately excised. Me, nine years old. I know this because I can recall the scene clearly. My birthday. In the photograph I am surrounded by crumpled balls of wrapping paper and presents. A cowboy rifle, an action man tank, several cars, and an assortment of books.
My father's foot can be seen at the bottom left corner of the frame. He is wearing the worn brown slippers I always remember, the pair with the hard rubber soles, the ones he used to like beating me with. He never wanted to hurt me, or so he said at the time. He always gave me a choice, the slipper or an hour spent locked up in the cubbyhole under the stairs. I always chose the slipper, because it was over quickly and I didn't like the dark under the stairs, or the thought of what it might contain. The door again. This year it is cleaner, as if someone has given it a lick of paint. The handle has been replaced. The letterbox shines. Sunlight is reflected off the golden knocker, making bright patterns on the camera lens. The next photograph is disturbing. It shows me sitting on the lap of a man I do not recognize. His eyes are large and empty. His creamy white hands are massive as they drape over my shoulders, and at least some of the fingers are resting at a weird angle, as if they are in fact boneless. I look... Well, my expression is unreadable. I am staring directly into the camera, but not smiling. There could be an element of pleading in my eyes, but that might just be the current me reading too much into a blank expression. My mother, dressed in flared pants and an ugly tie-dye blouse, stands to the side, leaning in the doorway that leads into the kitchen. She seems worried. Her eyes are dull and